around. So if you can, if we can keep it open, even the, even as with what um, um, your staff and Trueline have said, it's a one way. So it'll be um, stop go or, or traffic lights. It'll make a huge difference. It means that the traffic can still flow around. And I think another point: if you did close off either um, Burnett or Tancred, it effectively shuts both streets because you can't go in one and you can't get out the other. So it's not. I think when you look at it, you have to look at it that those both streets will be shut off in conjunction. Now, speaking from a selfish point of view in the arcade, well, that's that's two thirds of our access is cut off. So yeah, so. Mm. It certainly will make a difference if it's open. Councillor Lovett? I was just thinking about your customer base, because I know one shop, um, you know, you, you must have a group of people in this town that are supporting you guys, knowing the pain you're going through. Because I know one shop, I mean, they have been doing well because of their customers are making sure they shop, and it's probably a message. Do you think we need to get out there to, in the public arena to come and support your local retailers? But do you find you have a good supporting customer base? Because I know a lot of us, we will make sure we shop in this town and not go elsewhere because of the pain. Well, a lot of it is because it's essential service and they have to come there. Um, so that's why it's so important to get that access. Um, but, um, yeah, totally agree. That is part of what's going on. Council has been involved in a shop local campaign about nine months ago. I think they started it after we come out of lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I think one thing this last year, nine months, has proven is that we're an extremely loyal community. Um, and we're very thankful with that. But, but, but it, is, it has and it is difficult and we're just trying to minimise what we can. I it's, did notice when in Queenstown last week that they, on their roadworks, they've got a shop locally, you know, the towns, the streets are still open, um, shop locally on their, on all their um, fencing and everything. Yeah, no, the, the Queenstown's doing a um, upgrade of their CBD and they've <coughs> deemed it this is the best time to do it because there's no one there. But I don't know if there's a the best time, but um, it needs a time, there's a time when it needs to be done. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Gentlemen, I'm certainly on your side, um, and you know that, but I don't always show it, because I've been in retail as well. And you have to work for it. You know, you never get it for free. Um, <coughs> we try to do something what is really great for this town. Unfortunately, you guys are having the, the main burden there to, to carry. Um, but we had COVID, we had earthquakes, is that part of it as well? Now, you can't blame it all on the work we're doing. I know it's, it's hard and it's, it's, it's nasty to come through, but I don't care. I walk, I, and I'm an older one. I'm above the 55s, and I still come into town and buy. So you have to promote as much as you can. And what Chris said, you know, science might help. You know, we are open. Don't be scared, you know, something like that. But was, can you see another way we could have done it? The, with the whole program we're doing, because it's a major, a major thing. Um, no, I don't. Mm. Um, it is what, it, what is. it is, and as I say, you know, we can tolerate it, and we understand with these types of works that you know things come up which cost more, you know, other things are broken and and whatever, and and that's just part of. It's like having an old house or an old car with rust in it, isn't it? Um, so, um, you know, it's just another thing on top of another thing on top of another thing, and this is this is the the end of it, and that's why everyone needs some help with it. That's all. It's good, and I think the councils uh, listened to what you're saying, and um, uh, we're working with the retailers to minimise disruption. But we know there's disruption. Um, there's just no good time to do it. But once it's done, we'll forget about it and we'll have boom times, hopefully. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming in and uh, telling us that. We'll um, obviously do that item in public excluded later on today, so um, I'm not sure when you'll find out about the result, but um, as soon as we can release it, you'll know about it. So thanks very much. Sure. Thank you.
Uh, Councillors, next item is on number four, confirmation of the minutes. <clears throat> and there is an amendment to be made the, to include the names of new and long-serving staff who were acknowledged at the 17th of March meeting. And your copy on Stella has been updated, except for John, who can't open it. Any question, uh, alterations or additions on page four? Page five. Six, seven. Move for a seconder that the true and accurate. I'll move. Councillor McMillan, Councillor Lovett. We've got the motion. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Get, get carried. Thank you. Just one item out of there. Um, I think it's for you, Hamish. The report was going to be prepared on the Rangitata River and Restoration Ring, Rangitata River Restoration Project. Yeah, that'll be before Council on the uh, for your meeting on the twenty first of this right. month. Right, uh, fortnight's time. Right. Item number five: Audit and Risk Committee. Oh, Diane. Very minor, but I was in attendance as well at that meeting. But it's you, not noted. We did you zoom in that day? No, that, that was wasn't the zoom when, one. No, I was here. You're here, right. Uh, it's, got you, it's got you down as by Zoom. Oh, you're up to there. Oh, I haven't got there yet. Just getting to it. Um, Angus. Uh, sorry to interrupt the meeting, um, councillors and Mr Mayor. Um, if a councillor is having technical problems, why can't they get help? Help's coming. Item number five, Audit and Risk Committee, and we'll receive those. Move in a second up. Councillor Falloon, Councillor Cameron, all in favour, please say aye. aye. Received, thank you. Number six, Meth and Community Board, and we'll receive those minutes. Councillor McMillan. I'll move. I'll second. Councillor Letham. All in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Item number seven, Youth Council, and we'll receive those minutes. The mover, Councillor Brown, Councillor Lover. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Carried. Item number eight, reports, walking and cycling strategy. We have Martin and Brian in attendance. Just speak to your report, take it as read. Any further to add? Oh. Questions, councillors, before we go and debate? Councillor Cameron. Um, I have a few questions. Um, I also have some <coughs> remarks to make in the debate. We did, <coughs> I do recall us discussing um, the bridge walkways. Uh, cycleways, scooterways, whatever, and that we were going to put that as a high priority short term, so up to 2023. I can't find it in the walking and cycling strategy anywhere. Um, the reason why it's not in the walking and cycling strategy is that the State Highway Bridge is NZTA's yes. responsibility. We can't do anything uh, physically with that other than to lobby NZTA. We have done that. We've been to uh, various representatives of NZTA and we've been assured by them that they're working with OPUS at this, or WSP OPUS mm -hmm. at this particular point in time and coming up with a project for the low cost, low risk uh, plan going forward. And that's yes. where it sits at this particular point in time. Can I have a subsequent question, please? Yep. Um, yes, I understand that and you have mentioned <coughs> that to me before. Thank you. Um, my point is a lot of the recommendations in the report that we've discussed are in conjunction with NZTA. We will put an overbridge, you know, from the walkway to the museum and we'll get to Timwell route across the road sorted. So I don't underst I understand the bridge is owned by NZTA and that's outside of our control. I also understand the state highways are owned by NZTA and that's also out of our control. No? Not entirely true. Uh, in the urban area, yeah. we look after the um, footpath or from the curb back to the boundary. That yeah, is look. our responsibility, so we have got some degree of control. So when we put a traffic, a little walkway island in the middle of, say, the Timwald Archibald Street, so kids can cross to go to school, that's our department, not NZTA. 
uh, it's ours to put forward as a project. Mm -hmm. NZTA obviously have to approve it and also be aware of what's going on and look at the safety aspects of it. So I, I'm sorry to be cynical, but I cannot discern a difference. It, to me, it's like wordsmithing. Uh, 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 but I'll go. I'll bring that up in debate because I think we do need to sort that bridge out. On, and we've the only other, got one. So uh, the other side of the coin is we've indicated as a, a long-term um, objective within the strategy that we would try and get some form of connectivity across the Ashburton River, dealing with both bridges. Oh, you mean a new bridge? You mean by that? Because yes. we've got one bridge. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> one more remark. Um, in the meantime, wouldn't it be good to have the only form of connectivity we've got across a river up to muster, is my only remark there. Yes, and I think um, Council themselves have got the role to play there in the lobbying, uh, and you know the staff, we can only go so far. Uh, there's much more weight if it's directed from the council themselves to NZTA and that's is what I've been trying to indicate to you uh, at various stages. And I think we could do just that by putting it in the strategy because it's a council strategy and if it went in along those lines of that passing bay or whatever is required uh, over the bridge would be um, helpful. Now, Mr McKean, is it okay if we do that? Yes. Um, um, I suggest what we do is uh, on page 31 under the actions um, item 1.5 E, we could add the, the the current Ashburton Bridge as well as the second bridge. Um, we look at providing an opportunity for improved walking and cycling facilities, if that's uh, acceptable. The, the priority, would the priority be right? And then, uh, yeah, it, it's if, low if, you want, if you want to change the, the priority. Well, I, think, a, I think the... The feeling was it was high priority, short term. Would right. Yes. Lynette? Um, I just had two comments here on question on the um, race course road. You know, we discussed it, that's point 1.4 on page 30, I think it was. Um, it's a low priority, and now with all the subdivisions and stuff going on, race course road, I would have thought the safety of school children and walkers and cyclists would be a higher priority, we did talk about it, to get them off that road of, amongst all the trucks and things. Because I think it's down there as low, it should be um, high. And the other one, looking through the whole strategy on lighting on pedestrian crossings, it's been something we've noticed for a long time, our pedestrian crossings sort of at the other end of the day and in the dark they need lighting on them and, and through the strategy you talk about street lighting and that but nothing specific to actual pedestrian crossings themselves. Uh, something we could definitely look at. Uh, the street lighting is such that we're, well, we're um, under the process currently of uh, improving the street lights, bringing it uh, in Ashburton and where EA uh, undergrounding within an urban environment, uh, trying to bring those street lights up to the AS 1158 standard that we work to. Um, with pedestrian crossings, generally you've got the um, the beacon that's there, that's the amber beacon. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's just a straight out um, reflective sign. Um, we can look to to uh, try and put street lights in that situation. So something that we've possibly missed out on at this stage. Yeah, because a lot of them are very dark and you just do not see those people coming out to walk on the pedestrian crossings when the lights dim. But, you know, I'd like to see that remedied. But yeah, race course road, I don't think it is low priority. It should be moved up the ladder with all the subdivisions on the, on up that road. What item number was that? Uh, it was 1.4 on 1. page 4. 30. Yep. Take note. Yep. Take note, please. Thank okay. you. Councillor Miller. Thank you. Through the Chair, um, so I'm actually just looking on um, page 14 and you've got changes made to the strategy following the deliberation and you've got introduce a new, number 7, introduce a new objective 
in the action plan to investigate a learn to ride cycling space on council property. And I know um, this was a submission from uh, Lizzie Symington from Safe Communities, and I'm just hoping that that will be a collaborative approach um, because their group is quite, or our group is quite interested in, in working together um, with that. Thank you. Thanks for that, Liz. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Push your button, Liz. My question is page 30, 1.2. What are Methven and Mackay got that Ashburton and Trinwall haven't got? You look at page 35 um, about footpaths. I thought we were going to do that piece on Racecourse Road already mentioned and some in Timwall. You look at Rakaia, we're doing half the town in new footpaths. Why is so much going to be done there and not in Ashburton and Timwall to fill in the gaps? That's my first question. Well, basically, we're working to a... Um what would you call it, a strategy that's in line with the um, Ratepayers Association. Now, at this point in time with Rakaia, Rakaia uh, has been on the back burner as far as getting new footpaths is concerned because their association as a whole felt that the grass berms were sufficient and that all they really wanted uh, initially was to get curb and channel on their streets. And that's what we've been working on over the last few years. Now, with the walking and cycling strategy, we would like to try and get a solid uh, one footpath at least on one side of the road, which is Council's overall policy, and that's what we're trying to do in that instance. A supplementary, Mr Mayor. I'm yep. sure Timwall would be delighted to have a footpath on one side of Residential D, Residential C. It annoys me that Methven and Rakaira mentioned specifically in the short-term medium, mediums up to 2027, is there going to be nothing done in Ashburton and Tinwall till after 2027, including the piece on Racecourse Road from the entrance to Lockley to the next corner. And they've been complaining about that bit of footpath for years. And it's not even mentioned in the medium term. Uh, it's something we can certainly take on board as far as Council's wishes are concerned. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Mr Mayor. came up at the uh, Rakaia LTP meeting about the need for a footpath going from the north side of town on the right-hand side of the road down to the motor camp there. In other words, the people out there at the moment were almost forced to walk on the main road, and I think... It's not an NZTA matter, obviously, as you pointed out to Councillor Cameron before, but it is a matter for the ADC, and I think it should really be uh, put on the agenda somewhere. If I could answer that, no, Mr Mayor. Basically, there is no room on the state highway for a footpath in that vicinity without taking a chunk of land. Uh, if Council is willing to buy the land, we will put the footpath there. Otherwise, I would suggest that all it needs is a um, talk to the motorhome people, the other motor camp people, and tell them that if people are walking into Rakaia from the motor camp, please use the back entrance and come in through Tancred Street, I think it is, at down that end. And that would solve a lot of the problems. have um, one question myself before I go to Councillor Wilson. Shared footpaths, I think normal footpaths are 1.8 metres wide for um, so wheelchairs and mobility scooters can pass. How wide is a shared footpath? Basically we're working with a general footpath at this particular point in time at 1.5 metres. That's our council standard. Uh, for a shared path we would try and get it out to 2 metres. And a shared path is cycle and pedestrians? That's correct. Thanks. Uh, Stuart. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. That was part of my question. All those green dots of shared footpaths, are we actually going to go back to widening the footpaths again? We've been had a policy to narrow them up and put grass verges with them. Um, are we going to... All those green dots are going to be widened footpaths, are they? <laughs> if you'd like to put it that particular way, we would call them a shared path. Uh, which is different to a footpath, 
a footpath is just that for foot traffic only, and it wouldn't have any cycle uh, signs on them in any way, shape or form. Whereas a shared path uh, has the cycle come pedestrian um, figurine on them. If our question was, if they're 1.5 now, that's been our policy recently, hasn't it? Are we it's going for footpaths. To, footpaths, are we yes. going to put 0.3 of a metre on all these footpaths to make them shared? Well, we're looking at the possibility of either putting them uh, in the that particular situation, like widening the footpath out so that we get a shared path down the side of the road, or having a cycleway separate out on the road itself, but uh, hopefully um, in some way separated from the actual carriageway. They wouldn't be done unless the, um, that footpath was going to get an upgrade anyway. Well, we're looking at that as well, yes. Yep. <clears throat> Councillor Brown? Mr Mayor, if there are no more questions, I'm quite happy to move got, the recommendation. Uh, the, there's some more questions coming, I think. Councillor Rawlinson, questions? Um, question, well, sort of question come comment, because I was going to ask the we'll question... Go we'll move, go and debate if, you, debate if you want us to comment. Well, it was earlier, it was a question around the racecourse road, and I support that priority becoming much higher. So the debate, so come back to yeah, it. It's I a think. hard one, and I'd like yeah. to talk about cycle cycling on footpaths because I'm getting so much negative comment about the cycle shared cycling and walking footpath on uh, Cass Street. People do not like it. Yeah, I think that's debate as well, so okay. you can bring that up again okay. when we get the motion. Councillor Wilson, question, or we're going to move? Yeah, question. I'm still not satisfied with the answer regarding shared network. Mm. If we have a, a narrow footpath, a, a 1.5 footpath, and there's no place to make a cycleway, are we going to put a cycleway like a Nixon Street where there's parking each side? Are people not going to be able to park outside their property because we put a cycleway there? Because a lot of our roads are not going to be wide enough to have parking, cycleway and two-way traffic. How's that going to work? That's what we're trying to determine as to where, what the best situation is, whether it's a single footpath with a cycleway, if that's where we're going to put the cycleway, or is it better to widen the footpath in that particular area and make it a shared path? So they're the things we're looking at. We want to try and get the cyclists away and those on mobility um, the scooters and things of that nature away from the, the traffic so that more heavy traffic roads like East Street etc we would try and keep those the um, cycle mobility scooters things of that away from that area keep them away from the traffic go to a more or less trafficked road and widen the footpath even if it may mean slightly narrowing down the carriageway in those situations Okay, Councillor Brown. Mr Mayor, if there are no more questions, I'm quite happy to move the recommendations as they stand on page 13. Do you wish to speak to it? Or get a second to first? Councillor Andrew Mackay, speak to it if you wish. Uh, Councillor Cameron, no. Uh, Councillor Wallace, do you want to bring up your race oh, course? I've got comments to bring up there. Oh. Councillor Cameron. Do you want me to go now? Yeah. Um, I have, I'm in debate mode now, a lot of points to discuss. Um, I note point 1.4, point improving pedestrian and cyclist safety at Walnut Avenue, Chalmers Ave, improving pedestrian and cyclist safety at Walnut Ave, Oak Ave. There's a lot of improving pedestrian and cyclist safety and it's considered a high priority medium to long term. I don't know how you can have a high priority medium to long term. If it's a high priority, it's a high priority and it should be short term. Uh, and, those, and safety should never be long term. So I don't know, I'm not sure that we, we did have a workshop on this, but I'm not sure we'd just put anything at high priority as in long term. My other point I'd like to discuss is the only visible thing that we have done at the strategy at the moment, and given everything is short term, is the Walnut Avenue lights, which are low priority. So that's also bizarrely back the front to me, that we have the Walnut Avenue lights have been undertaken now and they're listed in here as 1.5 um, 1 point D, I think. <coughs> Installing traffic signals at Walnut Avenue, low priority short term. 
I thought it would be low priority because it's happening, it's out for tender, and short term because it's Being out done for now. tender. Yeah. So but our I priority on priority it is very low. An urgency basis. Yeah, but our priority in the strategy would be low because it's already being done. We don't need to focus okay, on it sure. because it's that. being focused on. Okay. I, I acknowledge and withdraw. Thank <laughs> <laughs> God for that. Uh, <laughs> that will be the only thing to do. Um, Mr Firth. Yeah, just in 1.4 there, the priority for the pedestrian crossings on Walton Avenue, etc., is high. And therefore, we know that it's going to happen as the yeah. low priority as the Mayor just mentioned. But for us, it's a high priority and it is going to happen. So once it's going to happen, it moves from a high to a low. Uh, once it's happening, yes. So luckily it coincided with the printing and the development of this report. It was good timing. Um, and my other point I'd like to make is the NZTA feature a lot, as I alluded to earlier, in our action plan with regards to, in conjunction with NZTA, and I think they feature um, with regards to cycleways, footpaths, e-bikes are even referred to in conjunction with NZTA. There's two parts to this question. Do we have the capacity and what is the likelihood of NZTA working in conjunction with um, Ashburton District Council, given the historical... Mum's success rate of this. Given that uh, we're looking for safe crossings across their highway, uh, I don't think we will have a major issue with them. Safety is a big thing with them at this particular point in time. If you're talking about a larger cost for a physical asset to be developed, that is a different matter. And I think you'll find that the priority will shift quite markedly from NZTA in that instance. <coughs> Councillor Wilson. Thank you, and I just want to come back to the supporting the ideas that were discussed earlier about that racecourse road and that footpath, because the people in that area have been asking for a long time, and every term of council it's just got shoved off down the priority list, and I'd like to see that come up a lot higher. And it's a, it's a safety thing. It's People are walking on the grass on the side of the road, and it's quite a number of them, and I just think we need to raise the priority. And my other comment was on the shared cycling and walking, and as I said earlier, people do not like that shared footpath. I know it looks beautiful on Cass Street, on the east side of Cass Street. I have a very close friend who cycles probably as much as anybody would in this town on her e-bike. Um, she's everywhere, and she said that um, she feels guilty riding along there on an e-bike because the people don't hear you coming. You're just quietly buzzing along and older people are walking along there in the middle of the footpath and you go round them on your bike. And it's not a very popular choice that we made there, I'm afraid. That's all I want to say. Yeah. Councillor Mr Firth? Basically, I think we need to wait until the complete project is completed to get the full impact of pedestrians cycling and cars. Uh, we're trying to slow the cars down. Currently on Cass Street, they're definitely not. Um, and they're not paying much attention to the signage that's there as well at this particular point in time. Uh, once the whole project is finished, especially the two one-way streets with their uh, bigger pedestrian focus, uh, I think you'll find that things will start to quieten down and people may get more used to uh, a shared uh, scenario. Did you want to move the priority from low to medium? Uh, definitely. If, if I can, can we move that we do that? Sorry, we'll just agree. Agree to do it. Yeah, I'll be okay. happy if we agree to move it to a uh, medium. Get it out of the low priority into medium or even higher. Mr. McKenzie. Yeah. Mr. McKenzie. Neil. Yeah, um, just to mention, um, we have received several comments about the cycleway down Cass Street, and what we were planning to do with the, the CBD project was to get a, an audit, um, safety audit done. Uh, what we've decided to do now is to bring forward the safety audit for the Cass Street, and then we'll come back and do the, the, for the rest. So we'll be undertaking a safety audit with an external SIP person who hasn't been involved before to review all these items that have been raised by people, particularly the cycleway. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Did we have a figure in here? I thought I saw a figure in here of 395,000 somewhere. Was that, am I correct? 
That's correct, uh, and the figure is part of the uh, long-term plan for walking and cycling. For it, three years? It, over the three-year period, yes. Councillor Brown, are you going to write a reply, or...? Uh, we're not yeah, there yeah yet. why does not? The question oh, is... No, we're not there yet. Yeah, no, I yeah. had a question. <laughs> but so you'll count, um, you got to write a reply left. It's Councillor Mackay. Um, Mr Mayor and Councillors, um, I actually believe the strategy, which is a strategy that we're voting on shortly, is good for Ashburton, and there are some misunderstandings, obviously, along the way. One, for example, might be the definition of a cycle. Um, a motorcycle used to be a thing that had a very heavy frame. This is 40 years ago, and a heavy motor on it, and used lots of gasoline and lots of oil. Um, Today, we have very sophisticated cycles. Some of them, you can even be going along uh, West Street at the speed of 50 k's and they pass you and they're not even pedalling. So would that be a motorcycle or would it be a cycle? And I think that once um, this whole project is done, that there may be some education required and maybe an updating of definitions and what is what, because I can remember um, on one of my travels, if I may digress for a minute, uh, the city of Xi'an in China. I went there and it was the most dirtiest, filthiest sky you could ever see. I was back there 18 months later, there was not a gasoline um, moped motorbike in sight. They were all electric and they had tried an experiment to speed up the traffic. They actually took the mopeds, mo electric motorcycles, um, off the roads and put on the streets with the people. The end result was the people went to the motorway and the cars were jammed up with people. So these things, but the sky was beautifully blue. So they obviously cleaned up the pollution, but created a lot of other problems with definition. And our sky is always blue, and I believe that we will actually sort through these once the whole project is done and people's behaviour is a accordingly. I support the project. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Just, um, yeah, I, I think the strategy is a very good strategy, well thought through, well um, consulted on, and to get where we are now. Just wait, how are we monitoring the progress? Who will monitor the progress on the way through to see we're achieving what we said we will achieve? Um, the staff will be involved in monitoring it as much as possible. Uh, the projects will be brought to council as they come up. Um, It'll be up to council to keep an eye on it, make certain that we are abiding by the strategy for one and uh, that we are doing the projects um, in the order that they should be done in. We have a few strategies and they all have timelines on them and they've got a couple of strategies that are dragging a wee bit. Do we need a strategy person to keep up to date with them to see that we are keeping up to date with our strategies? Tony. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, yes, so through, um, I think a couple of months ago I reported through my activity briefing that that's on the radar as a programme of work, is to get the actual reporting framework set up for our strategies and po key policies. Um, well, policies not so much, but our strategies and plans, and have that coming cycling through to Council. So um, forgive me, it has, I, I did say it would be about May or June when I would get that to you, um, and I'm still on track to do that. Right. Thank you. Councillor Brown, write a reply. Oh, hang on. Someone must have a... John, sorry. John. Yeah, I'd just like okay. to say I support the strategy. To me, it's been a well-thought-out uh, piece of work. We've gone back out to the public, gained submissions. We've listened to those, those, those submissions, and those submissions have now been incorporated into the strategy. As I say, I think it's been excellent work, excellently handled and excellently delivered. Fine. Mr Mayor, welcome to the future. It uh, took a long, long time in mid Canterbury to realise there is more than cars. We've got bikes and we can walk. So, the strategy I really enjoy and being part of it. Um, like I said, it's new. It's new for the district and I can hear it already. People don't like it because they have to share, but a lot of it is not finished. Give it a chance and everyone will like it. Welcome to the world. 
We'll put the motion. I'm in favour. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Thanks for the work you've done on it. It's great. Next item, number nine, Environment Canterbury Draft Long-Term Plan 2021-31 to 31, Submission. And uh, it is in front of you. Any questions? Oh, Emily, have you got anything to add first? Uh, thanks for the Chair. I just want to make one correction on the front page. It's under 1.2, the population should be 35,400 and that one should be the footnote to the bottom of the page. All right. <laughs> well, you were getting fairly accurate, fairly accurate with that one. Wasn't it? <laughs> <coughs> uh, Councillor McMillan. Thank you. I just had a question because I looked on the um, ECAN um, website yesterday and they've made a correction on the 30th of March so does that mean that you'll still keep your um, MA project um, exactly the same or will you change that um, according to their correction? Yeah, thank you through the chair. So um, yeah, that came as a surprise to us on the 30th of March as well. So you'll see in what point one point fourteen, um, we acknowledge the correction um, but we've still signal we still have kept our same stance in terms of it's a notable project for those affected properties. Councillor McGuire. Um, thank you councillors, Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, I hope you agree with me that this uh, submission is, in my opinion, very well written, but there are just a couple of issues that I'd like to ask about if that's okay. That's great, yep. That's okay. what we're here for. Um, it's, we're asking to support option two, which is an 18% rate rise. Um, I'm really struggling with that because that means that we actually support a rate rise of 18% in my opinion, if I read that right. Have I read that right? I think you have. Yeah. Um, can I please suggest that we try and put a bit of pressure on ECAN and go for a 9.5 minimum or maximum, whatever you like. Um, I have some others. Um, 1.5, I think that's the the main one. I, I think the push to um, targeted rates as to annual general charge, I think, I'm just wondering if we should push that a bit harder because uh, or maybe I have to wait until, we're in, we're in question time aren't we, so I can't debate that. Okay, you've got to come back on it then. So I come back on that. What do councillors think about 18% versus 10 or 5? Yeah. Okay, push your button off, Angus, and we'll Councillor Wallison. Thank you. And I'd just firstly say I thought it was well written. Just my question is on 1.12 um, regarding the total mobility funding, and it says in 2021 slash 11. I just wondered what, what that meant to say. <laughs> We're trying to lock it in for 100 years. No, that should say 2021, 20, 22. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lovett. I, I agree. You know, I was going to make the comment about lowering the rates um, another option because I don't believe, um, you know, the 18 or the 25. But nowhere in there are they, I was just wondering, could we make a comment to do with, they talk about nitrates and you know lowering all that, but they're not talking about the human impact on streams and rivers at all, anywhere in their LTP. And I, to me, they should be focusing on chemicals, you know, and wastewater, measuring what human effects having going down the sink and human medications. It's, I know it's a low government priority, but to me, we've got to start looking at that aspect of it as well, because it is poisoning fish and, and bird life, and no one seems to care, but everything's, well, I'll say it again, aimed at the farming and not urban. Whether we could make a comment um, kind of in that direction somehow. Yeah, if, uh, they do comment on the fresh waterways. And the septic tanks or the sewage from the town shouldn't be entering the fresh waterways. So if whatever um, chemicals the people are using, tablets or whatever, shouldn't be getting there. 
if they're discharging to the way they're supposed to discharge it. I assume that in their plan as they are looking to remove, there are some um, around the country, some wastewater plants that do discharge to rivers, but that's not allowed anymore. They've got to change. So I'm sure ECAN will be doing the same in their plan. Any other comments on that? Councillor Cameron? Um, <coughs> thank you for the report. I, I agree, it's succinctly written. When we um, talk about ECAN, I think of biosecurity and freshwater quality and wastewater quality and those sorts of things and looking after our environment. I don't necessarily think about transportation and all these other things. Did you um, model a rates reduction, as, as per Angus's point, of less than 18% and the impact of that? Like, did we look at saying to ECAN, stick to your historical knitting, if you like, especially in this straightened times of post-COVID, and we would like to see a reduction of 10% or 13 or 3% or whatever? So, thank you. Through the Chair. Um, so we, we took uh, ECAN's consultation material at its face value, and they are telling us in that that option two, which is the 18%, is essentially their bare bones budget, in their opinion, um, and the 25% is a little bit more than that. So they're saying the 18% is what they have to do based on what is coming at them out of central government. Um, happy to, to make a submission I'll, I'll with, a, with a suggested rate increase, but I certainly don't think we have enough um, transparency of what's going on in terms of their budget and to, uh, to be able to suggest fairly where they could cut. Yes. There might be one way, one place in there. <clears throat> I think in the submission you talk about loan funding and uh, looking at using um, the bulk of those or some of those monies for rewriting their plan because of the fresh water policy. And it's over, that plan will be over a period of time and it's probably um, logical that it is uh, loan funded over the period of the time like we do with our district plan. It lasts 10 years, we loan funded it over 10 years because that plan um, everyone gets to enjoy, or not, for the life of it. So it makes sense to loan fund it, which would bring the rate increase down, I think. Uh, Hamish? Oh, just, just one comment in relation to <coughs> Councillor Cameron's <coughs> comment. Um, regional councils are, just, are responsible for public transport. It's, it's just as much coordinating as um, the environmental matters that you raise. So um, I think all the functions that they are focusing on uh, core business is the extent to which they do them and the manner in which they deliver and the cost of that that is the fair issue but uh, public transport is no more or less something they can take out of their plan um, to reduce rates. It's their, it's their, it's not the City Council, it is the, it's the Regional Council's responsibility. So uh, just to clarify that point, uh, yep. Mr Mayor. And we don't have much public transport here so we don't pay for it either. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. My question is, the ratepayers have spent $60 million in 10 years on Plan Change 2. Should we comment and say, look, ECAN, we've just brought this in. Why are you going to spend $30 million and employ another 50 people to completely revamp that plan? I know the government has given them a few years, but should we not point out to them that this plan is meant to last till 2035, is it? the plan change too, and it's going to be completely ignored and start again. To me, um, from what we've heard of negotiations with Mr Parker, it is maybe possible, if he can stuck to their guns, that there could be some mitigation there, saving, it would save the big high rates. I think the 25% is because they're counting on spending millions and multi-millions redoing the whole plan. Uh, I think question time's over. We'll move into debate mode. Someone like to move? Oh, so would you have a question? Oh, no, 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 I was just going to um, clarify the question. Oh, okay, go for it then. Before, and I'll get Roger to move after that. Yeah, um, ECAN has a, a, a legal responsibility to deliver um, a regional policy statement, regional mm -hmm. plans in relation to the national um, essential fresh water policy. So they can't, they can't just uh, ignore that piece of work. The, the, I guess the sweet spot from the, um, as I would understand your, your point, is how um, fast they'll push, how much they will 
take note of the progress that's been made to date. Uh, um, but, but they still have a legal obligation to reflect the national um, policy statement as a new regional statement. So they can't just not do a plan. Um, they, they're obliged to do a plan. It's the contents of the plan that we should be very interested in. But they can't just put the whole planning framework aside because Plan Change 2 um, uh, is making you know, reasonable progress. <coughs> Roger, you want to move? Yeah, just want to move the recommendation, Mr. Mayor, that uh, we receive the report and we approve the submission to Environment Canterbury. I think it, um, uh, on their long-term plan, I, I think it's, the submission has been well written and like all things, we are not party to some of the more detailed discussions and whatnot that they've had in preparing their long-term plan. So by and large, um, I think... Uh, um, the, I'm very happy with it, and we should just proceed. Um, second, Councillor Lover. I'm second that. Yes. Open for the debate. I'd just like to think on the comments before the council supports option two. I don't think we do support, or I don't support option two. But what council, I think, council supports is the statutory work and prior commitments, and it goes into the doctrine to say that it can be loan funded. So there's another option there of using loan funding, which I think it's in the document. Yes. Yeah. So it's not option one, it's not option two, it's, a, it's another option, which they haven't thought of or we have. Absolutely, we can do that. Yeah. But, um, open for debate with the councillors. Angus. Uh, Mr Mayor, I totally agree with you. Um, <clears throat> and if that change is going to take place, I can then vote for it. Um, one of the problems I have is that a national policy statement put out by the Minister is, is and has to be absolutely adhered to. And the Chief Executive, in my opinion, was absolutely correct. So we do note, and you've even been to Wellington with a group of people, Mr Mayor, talking about the standards inside the national policy statement. Now... The Regional Council has that in this planning document. So in other words, through the National Policy Statement, it has got its research, it's got its standards, it's got its requirements, it's got its limits, and it's got its bottom lines, all in the National Policy Statement. So why on earth do they have to spend all this money in writing a plan? Because when one does a plan, I think most people would agree with me, it's the backroom stuff that takes the time. It's the collecting of the data, it's the writing of the data, it's doing uh, more research if it's thrown up. Um, it's all those kinds of things that can really use up the money because most of them have to be done by private consultants or, or um, very highly qualified, educated people have to be hired at big expense to actually put those reports together. So... If Environment Canterbury, we know that Environment Canterbury has to follow the National Policy Statement, so why is it costing so much? Um, and I believe that also uh, that they don't need that rate if they actually think about what they're going to write. Um, they have to put it in a presentation, and they might have to tidy up one or two things, but the amount of work they have to do is, I think, has disappeared because of the National Policy Statement. The other one is on the big high rates and what people want is most of us believe in sort of targeted rates and beneficiary pays. So who is the beneficiary here of this big high rate? Is it the people that are not associated with an activity such as farming or commercial? They want standards. The vast majority of people seem to want standards imposed upon other people so they can take a drive out into the country, see no cows on a dirt paddock, see no sheep um, wandering on the roadsides, that type of thing. They want a picture-perfect Switzerland um, tourist photograph of their image of New Zealand. And that is all very well and good. Um, even I would support that sort of thing. But there is a cost to that. So who's paying to do that? Is the the farmer, it's the um, person in business that's doing that. So if someone wants to feel good or impose something on those, they should be the ones that do the paying. 
therefore comes into play the uniform annual general charge of the, everyone across Canterbury. And I'd like to see us push a wee bit harder for the uniform annual general charge in this, and that would help bring the rates down, and also quiz E10 um, about why they have to do all this uh, big expensive stuff behind when the national policy statement have, has obviously set everything as the target or limit. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. So um, I would support, um, I don't support the 18% there. Yeah, I, I um, agree with you, Dan. Yeah. 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 Agree with you there. And I just read one line out of the, um, the Chairman's um, forward address that's on the um, document. And she says, we all share a collective responsibility for the future. We all share. And that can be either as a person or in monetary terms, but we all need to share it. And the UAGC, I think, will help that in certain places where it's appropriate. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. <coughs> now, I think our staff have done an excellent job of pushing the UAGC without going over the top. If I agree sort of where Councillor Mackay is coming from, but if we go keep on and on about it, they'll say they'll reject the whole shooting box. I thought you did it very well looking at it the way we look at it, with people and things like that. So I'm quite happy with the amount we've got in there regarding the UAPC. That's good. And um, Heke Hines managed aquifer recharge project. We're all supporting that. Good. <coughs> Any further debate? Yeah. Um, Hamish has just mentioned we did have a slight amendment to take the plan um, support um, option too, so we need to remove that. But, and if, it's, if the mover and the seconder is happy with that, that we remove it or we make an amendment. Roger. I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, the next off. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm happy, Mr Mayor. Yeah. To remove option two and yes. Yes. use a loan. If loan that, if that's... Yeah. The majority decision I <coughs> to remove it. Yeah. And the second uh, is also supports, yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Lynette, you had your light on before, is it? No, no, okay, right. Uh, write a reply, Roger, if needed. Nothing to say, Mr Chairman. I'll put the motion. I'm in favour. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Carried. It also will be speaking to the um, submission at the Environment Canterbury as well. <coughs> Next item of business is the Economic Development Quarterly Report to December 2020. Welcome, Richard. Anything to add to your report? Or? No, nothing to add to my report. Yep. Questions, councillors? So, Councillor Lover. I was just going to ask to help he can understand our district when they're making their long-term plan. Have they had a copy of their economic report to give to each one of their councillors to read? And when we get the new one done at 2.4, um, could that be sent to all the ECAN councillors just to read, to give them a bit of a balance of what this district could be facing when they're kind of making all their plans and things. Uh, on the assumption you're referring to the freshwater uh, report, um, we circulated that to ECAN alongside all other territorial authorities in the Canterbury region, so they all have that, yes. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. I thought economic development is economic development. A lot of what is in here is social what I call social things. Would you can um, light the Christmas tree? Yeah, that's hardly economic development. And um, a lot of this multi festival walks and things, what's that got to do with economic development? The economic development, I thought, was developing the economy of the district, not using ratepayers' money for social events. Hamish? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. E economic development is about the, the place that people live, work and play in. And so it touches um, all sorts of aspects uh, of community life. This report 
uh, reflects Council's adopted economic development plan. It has seven pillars. Those pillars are described as uh, this report describes them. So this is uh, simply reporting against Council's adopted economic development plan. Uh, if that plan uh, requires review at some point in the future, then we're obviously happy to do that. But that's what uh, is in your current plan, and this report is merely an update uh, for the last quarter's activity against that plan. Councillor McMill. Thank you. Um, through the Chair, just a question on number 24, which is on page 58, um, about the car or the surplus vehicle that was donated. So is that being used at the moment, or is that something planned for the future? Uh, through the Chair, that... Uh that program hasn't uh, started as yet, so we're still in the planning phase, but it's, it's, uh, some of the theory has been supplied to schools for students to start learning, but they haven't um, started doing the practical side of their driver practising. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lover? I was just going to ask the same question. Is it the vehicle will always be owned by the council, or is that going into a trust or something to be held for this? So in terms of the wider program, we're looking at um, the long-term home for the My Next Move program. And so we haven't finalised what that structure will be, but it's likely to be a community trust. But it may well be sitting with an existing organisation in mid Canterbury already. So we're just in the process of, of, of writing a business case, um, and that, that's going to define what we what we believe will be, or we'll, we'll tease out what we believe the best long-term position for that program will be. Question on um, item number 17, the 2.4 report. When's that due? When's its expected time of arrival now? So the follow-up report's due uh, mid-June. Mid -June. And um, reading the whole report here on the seven pillars, there's a lot of work going on. There's been a lot of meetings going on, which is great, setting the basis up for moving forward. And um, I'm looking forward to some more details in the activity reports of actually what's happening on the ground. So looking forward to that. And acknowledging this is up to December um, of last year, so we're four months into this month. So there must be stuff happening now, which uh, I look forward to seeing and celebrating in the activity reports. Um, Councillors, any further questions? Comments? If not, a mover for that we receive the Economic Development Quarterly Update Report for December to December 2020. I'll move. And I'll Council second. I'll second. Any further debate? I'll put the motion. I'm in favour. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Yes, carried. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. <coughs> Economic Development Quarterly Report, page 54. Oh, we have. Let's turn it. There we go. 11. Item 11. Review of district promotion. Oh, good ship. Page 59, Mr Mead. There we go. <coughs> Questions of Richard or Hamish? Councillor. I think, Mr Mead, yeah, there's a misprint on page 59 where it says the recommendation that the council agrees to enter into contract negations. We'll do a negotiation on that. Yeah. Thank you. Change that. And there's a big report done by someone. APR consultants as to which way we should um, be directed. Councillor McMillan. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions. Um, and I don't know who this one is for. Um, so with experience, McCandry, will that name still stand up even though the board no longer exists? Because I know it's mentioned so many times, experience McCandry are doing this and doing that. Yeah. I think it's a good name. I think um, the website still needs to be there. But how is that going to work in the future? Uh, through, through Mr Mayor, we haven't given that a, a huge amount of thought as of yet. The trust has wound up. So one of the um, uh, uh, slight confusions with the APR report where they talk about the option being um, um, 
to progress the winding up, if you like. Well, it's actually happened. Mm. Uh, they had the constitutional authority to wind themselves up, and they did. So they don't. They actually don't exist. Mm. So what sort of skin um, we agree with Christchurch New Zealand should be on the website is a is a different matter. And if the experience mid Canterbury name and logo and brand has a certain traction in the market, then it would be sensible perhaps to continue uh, to use that. Uh, it may be a question um, uh, if, if if this recommendation is passed uh, to to ask of Christchurch New Zealand and and to understand their perspective as as the council's. Um, promotion agency, uh, their view of um, the branding, if you like, of the piece mm -hmm. that is mid-Canterbury. Uh, but in terms of the trust, uh, it, it, it has already gone. Thank you, and I've got another question, if that's okay. Yeah, that um, so the Mid-Canterbury Tourism Advisory Group, and I presume we can talk to Bruce Moffat about this later today, but um, I know there's a number of local people on that group. Do we have anyone from council or a councillor who could go on that group as I know that there was a number of comments um, saying that there was a lack of connection um, between council and the tourism sector and I was just wondering, I know years ago there always used to be um, a councillor on its, on the board. Yep. Hamish? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good matter to refer to Bruce and Lauren um, later this afternoon. Uh, at the end of the day, if you recall when the change was made about 12 months ago to the arrangements with EMC uh, to contract directly with Christchurch New Zealand, part of that change was a recommendation to establish this advisory group, and if my memory is correct, uh, the names of recommended people to go on that advisory group were at least part of the consideration that Council mm -hmm. gave at that yes. time. Uh, how that advisory group is working in reality would be a really good question to ask of um, the Christchurch New Zealand reps. And if it would be strengthened by the addition of uh, council representation, then uh, we should certainly do that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Liz. You'll raise that later. Uh, it's a question, probably Richard. The KPIs are reviewed in the new contract. So who's going to renew, review those KPIs? Or is it Hamish? Yeah, no, sorry, sorry if you're okay there, Richard. The, um, that's for in here. So um, the... The economic development function reports through to Steve um, Fabish as our group manager of community services. The contract um, that between is now between Council and Christchurch New Zealand, if you pass this resolution, will be extended uh, for a further three-year period. Uh, then it is for it is for um, us in the office to give effect to this resolution of Council uh, should you should you pass it. So that will be for us to do. Yes. Got another so, question. Well, Thank you. Yeah. Um, through the chair, so this reading the comments from um, the survey or the email that they um, sent out, there seemed to be um, a lot of comment on sort of events and what was happening in the district, and um, I was wondering if part of um, our um, tourism um, budget, we could have an events calendar, which I know has been lacking in the district for years and years and years, and it would really showcase what's happening um, in the district. We have a, a lot of different <coughs> events here, um, and it would show the, not just our community, but the whole of New Zealand and the world what is actually happening um, in our district, and that would mean that um, motelias and accommodation places would know when they're going to get an influx um, and it would also sort of attract people to the district and I don't know if any thoughts being put into that and I don't know if Christchurch NZ do anything like this and maybe it's another question for Bruce later on but um, has that been considered um, in this report or, or going forward? Within the context of the report um, no, it hasn't specifically been considered. I mean, the, the, the scope was just to look at those four options. Um, but I know uh, the, the, the value of having visibility for a whole range of events, uh, you know, from a, from a central point has a lot of value, offers a lot of promise to, to um, other tourist operations to leverage off those. 
So we have the regional event fund, which is now being operationalised, if you like. So that's um, starting to flush out uh, a range of events. So we'll start to have visibility of what's coming forward if, if they actually apply for that fund. So so we are our capacity to start to consolidate those into one spot is, is certainly growing by, by the month, if you like. We could put it as a KPI in the KPIs that they produce a one, do you think? Uh, yes, I think it's a matter for discussion with them. It would be good to get their reaction initially. At the end of the day, the amount of money that um, is agreed, uh, well, was agreed for this last 12 months implied a certain level of service. Uh, and like any contract, it will be a matter of negotiation on whether or not Christchurch New Zealand have the capacity to add an event calendar across our district within the uh, resource that is allocated. Uh, would be a matter for us to discuss with them, but the, the matter uh, can clearly be uh, included in our discussions with Christchurch NZ. Yeah, we might find something that's uh, maybe swapped with something. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. 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 Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. I'm not, not in favour of this at this stage. We've got the people involved coming to speak to us, and I've got some questions for them. Why are we passing this? And then we ask them questions, and we might find something that we don't agree with the strategy. I mean, to me, it's got the cart before the horse. I was going to say something else, but... <laughs> <laughs> just, just to clarify that, um, Christchurch New Zealand are, are our current contractor. They, they come before council every quarter. Them coming this afternoon is um, their, their latest quarterly update, as opposed to... Uh, um, any link with this re review going forward. Now, there's an opportunity, clearly, to discuss matters uh, with them, uh, but this report was intended to uh, contemplate visitor promotion services and what's our um, way of doing that into the future, and it has clearly come up with a, a recommendation. Christchurch NZ are simply here this afternoon to give their quarterly report and discuss matters of interest in that relation uh, to, with Council. So it wasn't intended... It wasn't envisaged, I suppose, that Christchurch NZ were coming here uh, to um, in, a, in such a direct link with the ongoing uh, service provision. It wasn't it wasn't the officer's intention to link those in quite that way. Councillor Lovett, I was just wondering whether the events count, calendar would fall with Community House because they've been updating all the clubs and businesses and everything in the area. And they've got the volunteering um, side of it in there. Do they not have an a, events calendar, or could it be in conjunction with them as well? You think with the citizens' cab. advice bureau? Yes, um, not community health. Because a lot of people go there for information on events, what happen and stuff. So it all interconnects, and yeah, we need to have a good look at it. I think. Thoughts? Yeah, Angus. Um, Mr. Mayor, if. Council passes this recommendation. <coughs> Am I correct that um, once negotiations have completed and once the KPIs have been negotiated to what negotiators think, it will come back to this council to actually say yes or no? Is that correct? Yes, we can do that. Um, I'm ready to move, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I've got any other questions or move heavy foot to yeah. Liz, question? I was just going, it wasn't a question, I was just going to answer Councillor okay. Lovett's question. Where I, I don't think Community House have the capacity to um, do an events calendar as well as um, <coughs> what they're doing with their community, um, what's it called? Directory, yeah. I think it, it, it needs to be a standalone job and it needs to be done really, really well and I think it comes under tourism and it, it's bringing people to town so it really needs to be um, done by the tourism sector. Can I, are you going to move it? Yeah, I'm just seconding. Uh, Angus was going to move. Do you want to second? I just wanted to say something before you... And it's moved and seconded now, yeah, Carol. Oh, OK. It wasn't a question. Oh, debate. Um, I agree with you, Liz. And also think it's part of economic development as well as um, tourism promotion. And it should be 
through ADC website and ADC communication channels. I mean, Citizens Advice Bureau, first and foremost, is to give advice to people that are coming up with regards to whatever matter arises. Generally, people don't go to the Citizens Advice and say what events are happening in Ashburton this weekend. Whatever. So I totally I think that, and that's a great idea, Liz. Roger. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, and under options analysis, and option one was to stop funding tourism promotion. I, I looked at that, and the the disadvantages that are recorded here aren't too dramatic, I don't think. So, philosophical question: Should the ratepayers of our district be paying money to promote tourism? I don't think they should be. Councillor Wilson. I, I won't comment on that at the moment. I was going to speak about the events calendar. I think it's an excellent idea and I've asked myself for years why this district doesn't have a, an events calendar that's really widely promoted. There's not many weekends in this district that there's not some quite significant, particularly sporting event, but um, and in many other categories, and I totally support having something that really markets us because it's going to have a huge benefit to the complete community. Um, but can I comment on what Roger said? Can you up. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't. Dis I don't agree with him. I think that um, you know the district, the district needs to promote itself, and and a little contribution into the rates I don't think does any harm. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I support the recommendation. To me, what we've done, I mean, 12 months ago, we were in the situation where um, EMC was being wound up. We had to do something. We came to an arrangement with uh, Christchurch New Zealand to take over our tourism activities. And we've now got a report which gives me an assurance as a councillor that the recommendation that we've got here is correct because they've done their homework. They've talked to a lot of people. When one goes through the um, comments on page 87 of that, uh, on Stella, of that report, um, it is, and the one that really got me was EMC was sort of a destination total, that was it type of thing. What we're looking at with New Zealand, uh, Christchurch in New Zealand is a region, and we are part of a region. And therefore, if we want to support the region, we have got to throw a little bit of money into it. And what's $195,000? Therefore, I support the recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Councillor Latham's comment is music to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to point this out ever since I've been on the council. Tourist operators are one section of our community that will not support themselves. We put hundreds of thousands of dollars per year in, and they perhaps put it in single thousands in. They will not support our local tourist industry. They're quite happy. <coughs> Ask the question in there, did they want the council to stop funding them? Well, that's a silly question. It's like asking a pig, does he want to lose his tucker? I mean, they're, <coughs> to me, they're one section. Why should they be a section that's funded by ratepayers. What other section of our community, our business community, the plumbers and the builders, they're not supported by the council. And you look at where the money's spent. They talk about this tens of millions of dollars. Majority is at the petrol stations, the supermarkets, and the food outlets. There's people going through town. Mount Hutt is the jewel of our throne, but they promote themselves. So why should the ratepayers of this district promote Mount Hutt. What advantage is it to the ratepayers? Councillor Cameron. Um, I have an opposing view. I do support the recommendation and I think if you look at the uh, table or the historical growth chart on page 73, you can see that the tourism as a proportion of, of GDP is on the increase from 2002 to 2020. Um, I think also the tourism business in our region is a portion of our region, like we have the agricultural business, we have the industrial business, we have the commercial business, we have the tourism business, and I think all have their merits and all contribute to the town and its growth and its development and all employ people. 
and I think we need to recognise that and um, and support them where we can. And I think that the the analysis has been undertaken. We have the matrix of the recommendation. We have um, uh, feedback from people invested in the tourism business, and I think we should support the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Um, Mr. Mayor, Councillor, as I thought, Councillor Cameron's words were um, very, very good, and um, I would urge you to think about what she said, and hopefully you will agree with it. Um, there are a number of uh, things in this district that we wouldn't have, Mr. Mayor, if it wasn't for tourists. I don't believe uh, a farmer could pop into a hardware store in Meffin and buy some nails. He'd probably have to come to Ashburton. And instead of there being a mega ten, there'd only be a mitre ten. Um, there'd be less shops in Ashburton because of the number of people. And, that, and also the number of people that um, maybe stop at the beautiful oasis of Hines for certain conveniences. Uh, it was built by a councillor. Maybe if they didn't believe or know of Mid Canterbury or Ashburton District, they wouldn't have to stop there. They just pass straight through to Rangitata. So I urge you to support this because it will come back to us with um, uh, what the result of the negotiations are. It will also come back with KPIs, and I think that's when we should get into the nitty gritty of it. Uh, before uh, Councillor Brown, then we'll put the motion. Thank you. Uh, I'm certainly in favour of it. Um, it's a district promotion. To me, a district is everyone who's living here. Um, look at the CBD in a moment. We had a presentation before. They're not getting enough people in there. So by promoting this district, we might get tourists, New Zealand tourists on the moment. Um, so that might be in help there. Also, every dollar being spent here, well, not every, but most of the dollars being spent here, even in supermarkets or uh, petrol stations, most of them are owned by local businesses. So I certainly promote this uh, motion. Okay, debate finished. Councillor Mackay had your right to reply just before the last speaker. But I'll put the motion. I'm in favour. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Gets carried. Thank you. Uh, next item, we'll move to number 13, Ashburton Car Club Road Closure. Brian and Reese look straightforward to me. Councillor Wilson. I'll be quite happy to move the motion if nobody's got any questions. I'll see that. Did you have any objections to the closure? Not, not this one. Um, two days. Uh, not so far. We've only got another two days for objections. Um, this was put in um, fairly short notice, um, but we managed to get enough time to get the objections period done. But providing that there is no objections um, within the next two days, it should be able to proceed. And if there is an objection, what would happen? Uh, we'd have to bring it before yourselves again, um, possibly, if there's enough time. Um, but we'd try and resolve it between the person who was doing the objection. Right. OK. Councillor Flynn? Yeah, I'll just ask the question. When we're dealing with very experienced people like this, and every year these uh, road closures come up, is it a, an absolute obligation of council, or can council give that down to senior officers or the executive within it without us having to bother going through the same thing two and three times a year. Uh, Hamish, uh, just looking for someone to say whether or not uh, road closures can be delegated. I'm not sure of the answer to that, Jane. On to any wrong one again. Uh, you, through you, Mr Mayor, it cannot be delegated. We've looked at that before. So they would all come Good to council. Field. Moved, seconded, no further discussion. I'm in favour. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. It's carried. Thank you. Um, 2.30, uh, oh, yes, Bruce is here. Bruce, is Lauren coming? Is Lauren's coming? Uh, no, no, she's out. Okay. Well, if you'd like to come up now, that'd be great. And Paige, um, 
It's on the agenda that time. It's on my agenda. It's on page 97. 97. Yeah, item number 12, 97. Uh, welcome, Bruce, and you're going to give us the um, quarterly update. If you want to go through that, we can take questions afterwards. If you like. Absolutely. We have um, it in front of us. Geez, these microphones have amplified a bit, haven't they? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. Um, you would have seen my uh, report. We uh, made uh, quite a number of changes to the reports of previous uh, times. Uh, and one of the key things we've done is try to align as much of the report to the KPIs that have been set uh, by Council for Christchurch NZ. Uh, but key today, what I wanted to just highlight to you um, is quite a significant piece whereby um, MB has uh, changed the way they're doing the reporting, finally. Um, over the years, what has taken place is we used to have these uh, uh, spend uh, measures that were called the MRTEs, or Monthly Regional Tourism Estimates, and they literally were an estimate. Um, these were gathered through um, credit card transactions at a local level. There was an estimation of cash, an estimation of some online bookings that were made offshore and onshore prior to arrival, and in all honesty, they were, a, excuse my language, a bloody mess. Um, and really hard to be able to um, continue to measure. And uh, COVID put a stop to this, so MB found that uh, their crazy ways of uh, creating uh, uh, some of this, these numbers uh, was just not going to work. And so what they've done is they've gone back to the raw data, uh, which is what we see is what's called uh, TEX, um, and that is purely credit card transactional um, uh, means. Uh, so what that essentially means is that across the country, most... RTOs, DTOs, people like ourselves will see a, a reduction in what is considered as a tourism spend by around about 70%, which is a significant amount. Um, so I, I've sort of layered that through the report for you to give you a bit more of an understanding. Um, it, as I said, it's a, it's a nationwide thing. It's nothing that uh, we have any control over. Uh, MB have put a statement out on the website, which I've also included there as well for you. Um, if you wanted to have a look at that at a later date. Uh, but in, in, in essence, um, they've started using this from October um, and they launched it back to us uh, well, just a couple of weeks ago. So, um, yeah, so look, it, I, I guess the, the benefit of it is at least it's true fact. Uh, it's coming from Market View, which is the one and only database that uh, tracks FPOS and electronic transactions. Um, so, you know, we know it's really good, true data, um, and that's really important in this day and age. You'll also notice that I've included um, our new data hub, and I've also made mention that to make it easy for all of you to be able to read in the future, we'll put this into an infographic um, that'll give you a better idea of the scale of, of measurement that's going on. But I thought it's a good idea to in the first instance, give you a brief around what each of those um, pieces within the data hub mean. Um, the first one I talk about is the accommodation data program. Uh, this is a new program that uh, took over from where Stats New Zealand left uh, back in September of 19, I think it was, uh, and um, sorry, November of 19. And what uh, the government have done is uh, allowed a company called uh, Info or Fresh Info uh, to go ahead and produce an opt-in, opt-out mechanism whereby accommodators can literally do that opt-in or opt-out to share their commercial data uh, to the government. Uh, we currently have, I think for memory, about 28 establishments in this district uh, that appear to, uh, are prepared to opt-in. Um, so it gives us a bit of an understanding in terms of where we're at in terms of accommodation. One other piece we've got uh, for you, which is a new piece of data which we've been trying to get for some time, is uh, Airbnb Insights, uh, and it's called Air, Air DNA. So Christchurch NZ has purchased that, so we own it lock, stock and barrel in terms of the monthly reporting that comes with that. Um, we've always um, kept a close eye um, on the um, Airbnb sector, uh, and um, dare I say it, it's growing over the years. Um, and if we look at um, just February of last year, there's 137 establishments just in this district. So it's quite, quite an established uh, part of the industry. Um, they've taken a fairly significant hit with COVID, of course, 
Um, but, uh, you know, it's a very good chance that uh, they'll come up and play um, as the waters open again, certainly around the Methven and Inland Scenic area, which is, seems to be the most prolific area. Next I want to talk about uh, in brief, um, which is a rather difficult one to understand, but it's kind of measuring motorhome and rental cars um, as they're coming through our district and getting an understanding in terms of where the hotspots are um, and getting a good measure in terms of uh, what that looks like. Um, I can't give you much detail on that at this stage. There's a couple of graphs there that uh, all look very similar, um, but what we'll do is we'll try and um, we'll play around with that data as, uh, for the next meeting and give you a bit more of an understanding of how that really works. The one I'm really interested in is uh, 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 what we call, I've called figure four on that particular area, which shows um, the Ashburton Data Tech visitors, and it just shows when and where people are looking for accommodation. Um, so this is really specific to rental cars. So people hiring a rental car, and then they're looking, you know, peak, they're looking at two o'clock in the afternoon to find accommodation, which is very typical of a New Zealand traveller. They book very last minute, and that's been a real challenge over COVID because, you know, there's accommodators that are sitting there that, you know, in the morning they're dead, in the afternoon they're <coughs> flat out, and it's... Um, uh, you know, it's just one of those things, but it's just a really interesting uh, demand curve to look at. The next one I have there for you is um, just a bit of an understanding in terms of uh, where the domestic market is playing. There's uh, t uh, three years ago, um, TIA, which is Tourism Industry Tiara, uh, came out with a product called Digit, uh, which is the domestic growth product. And it sort of measured what domestic travellers wanted to do. And so we have a whole database that we can trim down to be able to understand what our, what our domestic travellers want to do in this district. And the key ones I've listed is um, a short walk uh, in the wilderness. Must be an American uh, brand because <laughs> we don't use wilderness, but in the bush. Uh, uh, shopping at local uh, and farmers markets, uh, which has become really quite um, uh, big over the years. Uh, visiting local restaurants, bathe in hot pools, which is uh, quite a topical point, uh, and then half-day touring uh, hikes more than three hours. So they're the typical five areas as to why people come into our district uh, at a tourism level. I've also got there a rough spend in terms of uh, what they're willing to pay. So WTP means willing to pay, uh, and uh, quite low really, <laughs> but um, you know that's how it is. Mm. So I've just put some uh, promotional activity in here. Uh, this is just uh, the quarter that's gone. I'll talk briefly about the promotional activities that uh, you can expect uh, as we move forward uh, into the opening of the borders, which is uh, wonderful news from yesterday. Finally, I just wanted to talk about, um, I'm not sure if you can see this in colour on your reports, but what I've done is we've uh, aligned the KPIs uh, with a strategic priority um, and then the activities that we're doing. So I've, I've given it a traffic light, um, which simply is uh, red, orange or green, and uh, that'll then a bit of progress as well. So if it is green, um, you know, we're, we've met it. If it's orange, we're still working through it, and that could be some time. Um, and uh, if it's uh, uh, red, then uh, we're still working through that completely, which we don't have. And finally, I've got a uh, budget there for you as well, just to give you an idea of... Uh, the uh, forecasted numbers for the next uh, couple of months. So, um, as we uh, mentioned, uh, was mentioned yesterday, um, Jacinta Ardern uh, agreed in principle with uh, the Australian borders that we'd start our first flights on the 19th of April, or well, officially 11.59 on the 18th. Uh, 19th of April, uh, we've seen quite a surge, particularly uh, into the Auckland market this morning. Uh, and we recognise that as probably VFR or visiting friends and relatives, and given that's the biggest populated area, that's probably an expectation that we would see that sort of demand growth. Um, but uh, we're starting to see some um, good booking flow into Christchurch, um, and um, I, we, hopefully that'll continue on. So what are we doing about it? We've got a second phase of Explore CHC, uh, which Mid Canterbury is heavily involved in because it's a winter focus. Um, and so we'll be doing... Um, a lot of work around the Australian market in terms of um, bringing them into, into ski, obviously, but also looking at things that they can do that they may not be skiers. So, um, you know, one of the key uh, pieces at the moment is the Apuki Thermal Pools, which is due to open in August. Um, so we'll be doing some pieces around that as well and some stories. 
Um, and then we'll also be talking about what people can do on the ground when they're in the Ashburton district that's not related to ski. Um, so it's uh, quite exciting. So the idea is basically is we're not, um, you know, there's, we're looking at a, uh, a qualified traveller that is a skier or a, or a family or a bunch of ski, a bunch of people that ideally don't want to ski but they'd like to be here to see the scenes around the snow-covered mountains and that sort of thing. So that's, uh, that's where we're looking from there. We've also got a series of um, social media pieces that are going across Australia as we ex as we speak. Um, I launched those last night into Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth. Um, and uh, it's too soon to be able to understand what it is. It's a 10-day campaign for this one. Uh, but um, I think we'll get some pretty good um, details around that. In terms of where we think the numbers are going to come from uh, once the borders are open, um, the first point is going to be, again, VFR. So this is mums and dads, uncles and aunties, and close family that will be coming back across the ditch um, who haven't seen their, their families in New Zealand or in Australia uh, for a year. So that's going to be the dominant market, certainly for the first six weeks. Um, we then believe the next market that will be off there will be um, a little bit of the corporate, around, around about 4% of our traditional travellers will be corporate. Um, then from there we're looking at what I consider as your generalised um, travellers, uh, which is around about... Um, they, they should probably come into play around about eight weeks into the border opening. Um, it's really going to come down to how the governments on both sides are going to handle the pre and post departure. Um, at this stage, um, they're working through a piece whereby you'll need to complete a um, declaration uh, that is likely to be included on the airline's website when you're making the booking or through the travel agency. Um, and there will be a lot of detail around that in terms of uh, current health, contacts, where is the predominant place that they're going to be located when they're away, either in Australia or New Zealand, and so on and so forth. And there will be a very big, um, I guess, uh, term and condition uh, that will be at the bottom, basically, that says if we go into a lockdown, we will not be financially uh, helping them to be able to get back to Australia. So they need to be very, very prepared to be in a disrupt situation, and they potentially could lose you know, the rights to their return airfare. Um, but, you know, and also the rights to be able to get back home again, it depends on how, how bad it is. Um, so there's a lot of information that's come out this morning, uh, and the best point of reference is covid19.gov.nz, um, and they've got referencing to do exactly with that in terms of what that's <coughs> going to look like. Um, so as we get more detail around that, um, we'll be able to give you a bit more of an understanding, but um, there's lots going on. Um, I think I'm in my sixth Zoom meeting today. <laughs> it's been bloody crazy. Um, and there's a few more tomorrow as well. So, um, you know, I'm up to my eyeballs in, uh, in the 19th of... Uh, I don't think I'll forget that date, 19th of April, 2021. So uh, that sort of uh, consolidates the report. Um, and I wonder if you have any, any questions. Thanks, Bruce. And there's some questions now. Lights are on. Councillor Cameron. Um, thank you, Bruce. That was a, a great report, and I appreciate the new way of showcasing the data. Um, I just have another question. We've just, Liz has just mentioned about doing our events calendar. Mm. You know, do you promote local events in Ashburton via your sources? Yes, Are we they, do. Okay. Yeah, on our website, we've got a yeah. very, very healthy What's On page. Okay. We get about uh, between four and 600 hits per week on Google. Um, specifically for that page. Um, you would have light up the night or whatever on the event. Everything. Yeah. Everything. The, big, the hardest part is actually capturing them. Um, and quite often I'll capture them through Facebook, um, where people have just put out a Facebook event yeah. and I'll just copy and put it straight okay. back in. And we've done quite a, quite a bit of promotion over the years um, uh, to really try and push people to remember to put, put it onto the what's, not, what's on. They can literally log in and they can do it themselves and they can add photographs and they okay. can you know, put all your details around so that. So you've got a relationship with the ADC, Eastburn District Council? To, yeah, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Great. Councillor Council McMillan. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions if that's okay. Um, the experienced McCanterbury name, mm -hmm. is that still used now that the board has wound up? Uh, currently, yes, more from a marketing perspective. Um, uh, you've probably seen in this latest report there's no mention of uh, Experience McHenry because that's the request that we've had from ADC. Um, we are probably in end, it'll be probably the end of May now at this stage. We're going to run um, a series of um, short meetings with our operators and other business people around the district to understand 
what is our brand? And perhaps out of that we may get um, a new logo, um, uh, a tagline, uh, and also perhaps a, a new identity. Um, so we'll work through that, but in the meantime, yeah, experience me, Canterbury is. Okay, and another Canterbury's. question if I can. Um, can you remind me who's on the advisory board? Please. Yes, yeah. indeed. Uh, so we have uh, Richie Owen, who is the uh, current chair. Uh, we've got Karen uh, Herald. Uh, she is deputy chair. We've got Michelle Klein, who's from the uh, Bella Vista Ash Burden. Uh, we've got Jen Parks, who's one of our um, local Instagrammer um, uh, influencers. And we also have um, Kevin from uh, Methvin Helicopters. Uh, and then, who am I missing? One, two, three, four, five. It's another influencer, isn't there? There is, and I just can't think of who it is. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a list. So do you think there's room, and I presume you've read the report. Um, no? Okay. Do you think there's room for um, either a councillor or someone from council to be on that advisory board? So, so there's a connection. Yes, as... as um, so when we started the advisory board, uh, Bevan was actually part, uh, part of the membership. Um, and of course, uh, now we're just waiting to understand from ADC who that person might be that will represent that space. Okay. A, a staff member or a councillor? Either or. Or both? Or both. If needed. Really happy to have both. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll feed back to you on that one. Perfect. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Yes, first of all, I'm not volunteering to go on. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I've got three questions, if that's right, Mr Mayor. The first one is, your T M R T E S. you stoutly defended that for 10 years. Now you say it's a proper so-and-so. Mm. How am I to believe that the new one is not just as bad? Because you, I've tried to say it was rubbish, and you <laughs> said, no, 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 no. What what um, guarantee have I got that TECT isn't a, a rubbish one as well? Well, I guess the guarantee that you have, firstly, uh, firstly, it's only been six years that I've been in the business here, so it definitely hasn't been 10 years that I've been going on about it. Um, and secondly, they've only been in the market three years. Um, look, we're an industry that struggles for really good real-time data. So when we get something, it's like, it's like a kid in a lollipop shop, to be really honest with you. You know, it gives us some really good understanding in terms of what we're doing. And when we've got nothing else, we have to hang our hats on what we've got. And so that's why we've done that, and that's why I've been promoting that, that data. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's central government data. We've got no control over it, um, and, um, and that, that's what it is. Um, in terms of the tech, look, this is real data that's coming directly from FPOS machines. So um, anybody that's paying for, um, with a, for a product with FPOS or um, uh, international or a domestic visa is automatically going to hit that database. Um, the database is then updated every single month, but we don't see it for two months behind. Um, so look, I, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a percentage of, um, uh, you know, a percentage of, um, what am I thinking of? Um, of difference in result, but it's going to be certainly truer than what we've currently got. Yes, thanks. The second question, accommodation occupancy rate in Ashburton, they sort of average in there about on page 100. How would that compare with the long term in Ashburton? Is that all they can really rely on, 30%? So if we look at that, that's over an entire period of, of a year. So when we look at occupancy rates, um, they change dramatically over over the year, and it depends on a what's going on. There could be a, a concert, there could be a conference, there could be any number of things um, that that's going on that changes that occupancy level. Um, uh, typically, our occupancy level has been around about forty five percent over the years. It has dropped, so obviously with COVID um, in the last year. Um, but part of that is because of Airbnb. Uh, and you can ask a lot of the operators out there about EMVs and <laughs> Airbnbs, and they um, they'll certainly tell you what they think of them. Um, and so, look, if we take that into consideration and take the um, occupation uh, um, occupancy rates as well for the Airbnbs, it kind of makes a bit more of an understanding in terms of where our people are staying. The third question on page one hundred two. 
those hot spots? Is that where people are contacting where accommodation is? Or I mean, at Hines, there's three different streets. They're not staying there. Are they pulled in there and say, where can we stay or where there's a toilet? Or what, what does that actually indicate? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it indicates. So, so, somebody's, um, so this is taken from a number of different apps uh, run by rental car companies um, and also motor. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the app called uh, CamperMate. Um, now, everybody that I know, uh, certainly around our market, is at the very least has got CamperMate on their phone. And so what that's doing basically is as you're stopping, it's looking at place, it's looking at time and location as to when you're stopping to look for those things. So, so there are three parts. One, when you're stopping, what time, and what you're looking for on the app, and that's how, it, that's how we get that data. It's quite a strong piece of data. It's still a lot of work to be done on it, um, but it's, a, it's certainly next level from what we've had in the past. Basic, isn't it? Uh, yes and no. Um, yeah, uh, look at the end of the day, there's data, data information wherever you go these days. Um, we're looking at another piece of data um, as we speak um, called Data Ventures. This is actually the retail side of Stats New Zealand, um, and they actually can provide details from the three telcos um, of exactly what's going on. And we can see when people's phones are waking up in a dis different district or a different place, and that gives us an understanding whether or not they're a visitor or a local and that sort of thing. So, um, But, you know, we don't get any of the information around the telephone numbers or anything like that. We literally just get a dot on a map that says that's what these people were doing. Councillor Lover? i just got several questions. The Airbnbs, they're popping up everywhere. Mm. Is, is there standards on them? Do they get audited or can just anyone go into them? Because you hear people <coughs> in spare rooms doing it and mm. I sort of wonder um, where, where it's finally going to lead to. Would there be good ones and bad ones and it could do a lot of damage? Airbnb do, do some qualification but I don't think it's a standardised um, requirement. Um, so yeah, we do see some pretty disastrous situations and that's one of the concerns that we have as an industry is that there is no um, uh, consistency um, you know in, in terms of the experience that's been delivered you know we work really really hard to get people to come to our district and all we're going to need is one person that gives it a bad name and they'll never come back again you know or they'll tell 20 or 30 people in fact I think it's 60 these days um, about their experience in Ashburton and that's the thing that really worries me about Airbnbs. The other question I had was around your visitor activities, um, whether we should have a, a piece in there for um, biking on trails, because we are trying to connect bike trails, and there's a lot in the district. Yeah, and definitely. Be, and you see all these camper vans going through with all the bikes on the back, and yep. it would be good to sort of hitch on the back of that, because it would let us know if we need to kind of do more in that space to get people to come here. Most definitely. There, there isn't, as far as I'm aware, an app that can measure that detail around cycling at this stage. I think it will definitely come because it's a very, very, very big product in, uh, yes. across New Zealand. Mm. Um, uh, but to that point, um, the Mid Canterbury Advi uh, Tourism Advisory Board is also looking at um, how we can do some more work around the cycleways of the Mid Canterbury. Um, and um, so we literally just started on that and taking over from a project that sort of took place around about 10 or 11 years ago. Um, and so we're going to start having a look at what that looks like, how we can do something with it, if it already exists, how can we join things together, just like you were talking about, um, and then getting some understanding in terms of, um, you know, some data pieces and insights in terms of, um, you know, who would use it and, and how it would be used in terms of as a family, as a touring, as it, you know, all those types of things. Um, over the over the, um, the last weekend, I was down uh, quite close to the Alps to Ocean area there, and whilst it wasn't overly busy, um, you know they've got some really good. Um, I noticed some little indicators that are on posts and that sort of thing, and uh, as you walk past, it's clicking, so they can get a bit of an idea of the numbers that have going past there. So it's, in in its simple state, that's what we could do, um, but uh, you know if we get it to an electronic form, that'd be magic. The other question I had was um, trucks. There's no information there you're gathering on people coming through Ashburton, whether they're in business or holidaying or you know, travelling through, because yeah. now we're seeing lots of trucks parked up, and, and if it's, we're going to become a popular 
track stop for overnight as the companies whether we should be looking at um, proper parking up for them because it's just starting to park up streets. Mm. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't get to understand what vehicle types they are or anything like that. It's literally a ping off an app. Um, so, yeah, pretty difficult. Councillor Brown. Thank you. Bruce, just for my info, um, HHI, I think I've got it worked out, household income, is that correct? The other one I can't, can't work out, EAV. The which, sorry? EAV. EA. Fee. Fee. Yeah. V. EAV. Oh, EAV. Sorry. Yeah, Estima that's the one. Sorry. Yeah, EAV. Estimated yeah, advertising yeah, value. That's talking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so what does it mean? Uh, so what EAV is, is that... Um, uh, it's it's a a value that an expected value that you would get out of advertising. So any advertising agency that we work with will say, look, we want to do um, let's say we want to do a marketing piece around the Ashburton uh, Ashburton Gardens, for an example. Um, we would then have an expectation of EAV um, on that particular campaign. Um, so what we do is, what you can see there is, uh, I think it's 4 million uh, EAV. So basically what we're saying is everything we do throughout the year, that should be the value of that particular piece that we've put out there or those packages that we've put out there in terms of marketing. And how do you measure that? Uh, the only way we can measure it is it's through a whole different um, types of me uh, measures, um, it's mainly done through agencies. Um, so what they do is they go back and they look at... Um, uh, they they look at where it's been. The estimated value would it would be if. So I'll give you an example. If this this particular campaign that's going on right now in Sydney, Melbourne, and uh, and Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, and Brisbane. No, sorry, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, and um, uh, Victoria. Um, if we looked at the EAV there, what they would do is they would look at how much it would have cost us to have that particular ad or or that particular um, campaign into a local press industry. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, one small ad in the Sydney Morning Herald costs about $27,000 a day. So they will take something like that measure, along with a couple of other measures that they can get from Facebook and Google and all those sort of things, and they can then get some sort of understanding in terms of what that value is. Thank you. Councillor Kimmer. Uh, just a quick question with regards to the tech data again. Mm. You're doing visa cards and things. So somehow they can exclude local addresses, can they, on that visa card? So yes, they can. external addresses. Yes. And then can you break that down further by like Canterbury and Auckland and Australia from yes. those addresses from there? They can. Um, they, they, they've chosen not to break down domestic at this stage um, other than... Uh, I think they're looking at maybe five major cities, one of those, of course, being Christchurch. Mm -hmm. um, and then outside that, they'll break it down into country, uh, which is what they've done in the past. Um, and uh, again, it's still sitting with the parameters that that card must be issued 40 kilometres outside this district. Uh, so places like Christchurch, for example, would be validated on, on that particular report. Okay. Um, somewhere like, um, say, um, uh, Timaru would probably just get in there. Um, but, um, yeah, they've, they've, they, it's always been a measure of 40 kilometres. Okay. I note that on um, the tourism spend model, we've gone from fifth to sixth, basically, in the region. Yeah. Which possibly, do you think that that's a more genuine reflection of, of where we possibly ought to be? Uh, look, I've, for, for a long time we've said it's sort of fourth. Um, I think there are two parts to that. Uh, one definitely is the COVID effect, mm -hmm. and the second part is definitely, look, we're looking at new new, new numbers um, and more realistic numbers. Yeah. Um, so, look, I'm happy to, you know, at, at this particular point, we're about halfway. Well, it is what um, it is also. Yeah, yeah, it is at the moment, and until we can sort of start getting some <coughs> more gravity around uh, the borders and, and getting more Australians to come in and play, um, then, you know, we can try and build that back up again. Yeah. And I just got one more remark following... Um, Stuart's comment on the occupancy rates of the motels. Mm. Are the motelliers all in good heart and good, like, have they got enough left to gear up again for when the Australians come home? For the most part, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've had a few tears on telephones uh, over, over the last, uh, certainly over the last couple of weeks. We've got three or four operators that may not survive um, through the winter. In Ashburton? Um, in, or in the in Ash, across the district. Um, we have got some very, very good um, quality product that's coming, coming in. Uh, you know, if I take um, you know, the Bella Vista um, Taylors and uh, Quality Suites Hotel, for an example, they're 
consistently busy and have been over the last couple of months. Um, and some of the reasons for that is we're now starting to see um, a lot of that corporate market coming back, yes. um, which is great. So, you know, they're dropping the Zoom meetings and actually coming back and doing some physical stuff on the ground, which is fantastic. Um, but we're also starting to see people moving more around the regional areas um, as part of what we did with Tourism New Zealand in terms of uh, Do Something New New Zealand campaign. And when you mentioned, can I one, thank you. When you mention quality product, what, what do you mean by quality product? Um, so, in terms of the service and the experience that we offer yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. So, so new, new, new services or new offerings in the town? New services, sure. new offerings, better pricing. Um, uh, and when I say better pricing, you know, um, a lot of our operators, um, when they pivoted to domestic, um, they recognised that they needed to make some simple changes around, around their dynamic pricing to, to make sure that they can get, get people on board. So it's good. Mount Hutt, what sort of season is it going to gear up for? You know, well, I think they're going to have a pretty successful um, uh, season. Um, and, and look, Mount Hutt have taken an approach whereby they're still unsure whether or not the Australian market will be coming to play this season. Um, so they're taking a very big approach that step A, or um, their, their um, uh, step A is just going to be domestic New Zealand and, and a really big focus around that. Um, and if the Australians come on board, then fantastic, and they'll move to sort of a step B. Um, there's, there's a lot of focus that's going on around the mountain in terms of the new lift that's been put in, or it's in the process of being signed off at the moment. Um, you know, that's going to move a considerable amount of people every hour, so we're not going to see the, you know, the queues and that sort of thing that we've had in the past. The other part as well is it's going to reduce their closed days by about 50%, um, and the reason for that is because each seat is one tonne, and it's got, you know, it's got a lot more retardant against the wind that's up there, uh, whereas the little seats they used to have, they used to flop mm -hmm. around all over the place, um, and they had to close relatively quickly. Um, you know, so that's going to that's going to have a, a better experience for people that are wanting to go go skiing. And of course, in August um, we've got the Opuki Thermal Pools opening, which is coming <coughs> bloody quickly. Um, and um, you know, the the directors are doing some great work on the ground at the moment. Um, we've been doing some work in terms of how we can engage with them um, uh, so that we can get the message out to Australia to say, look, you don't need to be skiing in our district. You can come and you know walk or cycle, or you know, in fact, you can go and uh, you know jump in the, to the adults only swimming pool for an example. So there'll be job opportunities there shortly too? Absolutely. And the yeah. Mount Hutt, the pools and all that? Yeah, yeah, well Mount Hutt last year ran on about a third of their staff. So, um, you know, they, they're, they're hunting for staff as we speak. Um, you know, the, the, the exciting part is now the borders are open, there will be opportunity to get some of the staff they've had out of Australia and the likes of. Um, so it's looking a little bit more exciting for them. Okay, I've got two more questions. Thank you. Um, firstly, the, the <coughs> hot spots for motorhomes, Bruce, because Stuart kind of asked my question, I wonder whether those were where people are show, staying or, but it's obviously just where they're stopping to talk. Yeah, it's, it's literally, it's where the app's picking up that ping um, and then it relates to that, that particular location. There's, there's, that's where the gravity is still to sort of, there needs to be a little bit more work done around the specifics in terms of, you know, are they stopping at an accommodation, are they stopping at a place to, of interest um, uh, and that sort of thing. So hopefully they'll get to that level. Um, the detail is there, it's whether or not they can produce it. Um, so where the data has come from is um, the gentleman owns, that owns um, Geozone, he thought a great idea about, I think it was about 10 or 12 years ago, to jump on a motorbike and he GPSed the entire country. Um, so he went to every service station, every um, uh, freedom camping site, every every motel, hotel, and he GPSed it. So we know he's got the data. It's just whether or not he's prepared to, you know, to work it out so that we can get some more, um, you know, more, more detail around what those what that detail looks like. So is that similar to where we used to get the mapping, where people had stayed, where they freedom camped, or they showed whether they're in a camping ground, or or the motorhome association stop spots? That's correct. To identify that, because yep. that's, yep. that's where it will be more interesting. Excellent. And my second question, if I may, is around your events list, and you know, totally, I think we've come, had a conversation before about your events list, how do we get local people to put their 
significant sporting events on there, for instance. And I mean, there's been dragon boat racing and all lots of big events at Lake Hood lately. Yes, Are they yeah. coming and putting them on your list? Uh, no, uh, some, look, the dragon boat racing is a great example. Mm. Um, the organiser there I contacted beforehand and uh, and she said, oh, look, I'm just going to use Facebook. And I said, well, nobody knows about it. You know, you're not going to mm. get, you're not going to get the spectators that are going to come and, and um, you know, be with us. There's been a lot of commentary actually around that because, you know, there's a lot of people here that would love to have gone to see it, they just didn't know it was on. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so it's always been a challenge and it is across the nation, to be honest, you know, not everybody likes to share what's going on and they tend to think that Facebook advertising is the be-all and end-all. Um, it's not, obviously. Um, but, uh, look, the best thing we can do is we can, I can, you know, get into the media here and, um, you know, perhaps create a bit of a story about the importance of doing so. Um, if we look at the current visitor strategy that we've put into place, um, um, they are re now required under the application, uh, if, they, if they're uh, applying for funding through the ADC, um, through the Regional Events Fund, um, they are now required to uh, be, on, uh, be on the What's On page um, along with a number of other conditions as well. Good to hear, thank you. That's right. Is there a charge to go on that event funding? Like the Dragon Boat, they didn't want to go on? Absolutely zero. zero. It's free of charge. Okay. Interesting why they didn't want Likewise, to any business or any, any, any service can be on our website as well. We've got, uh, we've got categories on the website that anybody can be on. Yep. We've probably got about 40% of the businesses that are on our website at the moment. Mm. Final, then you and I was just going to comment on that events calendar because I've just had a good look through it and yeah. I don't think it's ad adequate. It doesn't um, seem to link up with the Ashburton District Council website so I think there's something we can do there and mm -hmm. if you look at Mid Canterbury you get a lot of Tamuka markets and Pleasant Point Railway um, and you said that a lot of people like to come to local markets. We don't have the Ashburton Farmers Market on there. So th I think it's something that mm. really needs mm. to grow, and I don't know whether it's something that um, you do or whether it's something that jointly council could do with you. At, but it, I think the word needs to get out. And it, I and agree. We, yeah, um, yeah I, I just think... It's it may be hard to, to get those people on, but once you're getting them on there... Well, I'll give you a great example is the Meth for an A&P show. They didn't advertise. I rang them and said, do you want to advertise on there? You know, that's, that, that, there's some very big events that go on that I know for a fact they're not coming and putting it onto the What's On page. So supplementary, can't you do that, or do you need but, them to put all the details on? I'm more than happy to do it if they email me the details. I don't have a clue what they what, what, what they want to advertise, you know, quite literally. Mm. Uh, Interesting. I, I, I simply see it from posters that are around the, uh, around the <coughs> various different uh, gate posts of the district, and I'll pick up on those sometimes. And if mm -hmm. I can, I'll go and find who the organiser is, and that how I do that is go back to the previous organiser of the year before, and I hope it's the same people, or I'll go onto Facebook to see what we can find. So, um, yeah, it's a bit of explore, uh, you know, ex okay. exploratory pieces. Just one link missing in the chain there. So thanks, yeah, definitely. Thanks yeah. very much, Bruce, for that um, update. Very valuable for us. Um, would someone like to move that we receive that presentation? Report. Oh, Councillor Cameron, Councillor Rawlinson. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Carried. We'll need a break for a cup of tea. Come back at um, 20 past five. Thank you.
Yeah. Welcome back after the councillors after the um, afternoon break and everybody else who is here with us. Um, we're now moving on to item number 14, which is the financial variance report. And um, I'll just go through it page by page and with Rachel joining us for separate, questions. Separate attachment. Yeah. Oh, separate attachment, sorry. I'm up to page number six. Uh, have you opened the attachment yet? Page number three. So, yeah. So, any questions? Page number three. I just can't get out. Carolyn. <laughs> 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 Luckily, your, your light is not on. Excuse me. Page number three. Number four. Five. Six. This is the end of February, so it's probably eight months. It's eight months through, is it? Yeah. Casinas wise would be. 75? Uh, 67%. 67. You're two thirds of the way through the year, end of February, eight out of 12 months. Only 67%, yeah. yeah. 67%. 67%. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Oh, Councillor Wilson? Yes, uh, page five, usually a yes means it's not going to be achieved. Uh, those roading expenditure, does that mean we're not going to spend that money in the year? Uh, uh, there's a, a comment, sorry, for the page on page six about it. It, it, it just as you read those, um, Councillor, the, all those variances are related to the CBD work. So that we complete, they will, the money will be uh, spent by the end of that project, but they won't be completely spent by the end of June, which is the financial period that this report refers to. I thought, as I suggested last time when we talked about this, that we would spend that money on next year's roading so that it, we'd spent the money and then next year we'd have the money that we were going to spend <coughs> on that project we could shift over to the CBD. I don't believe that could be done. Um, I did check with Brian and being the end of the three-year um, period program I think there's a, there was a problem with, with that. We don't want to leave any subsidy laying on the table, so to speak. That's correct, yep. Page seven. Page eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. 12. Councillor Mackay. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. At the very bottom of page 12, this is likely to remain. Should it not mean, should we not ask that it will, that will replace us likely? Give the last sentence. It's likely to remain. Or is it too early to put the word will remain? I, th I think that would apply if you're saying it will. Yeah. Next one will probably have will. Unless you have spent the money on fish screens, which we're still investigating. Uh, supplementary then. Yeah. Thanks. Unless we've spent money on fish screens. Um, I thought um, for clarification, in the debates that we had, in the lead up to the long term plan, I thought uh, when I commented about an officer being enlightened and congratulated that officer for his comment at the time, I thought fish screens were gone. When I emailed the um, financial officer and asked um, 
why fish screens have not been uh, taken out of the long-term plan. The reply I got was that fish screens were never in the long-term plan. Now that was the confusion because we got a list of capital items that shouldn't have really been sent to us in the first place. So just clarification, um, we're not fish screening, are we? Through the Chair, we're intending not to and we'll Good. do the best we can to avoid um, installing our own fish screens um, and rather get the water supplied through um, the RDR. Good. Fish okay. 13. 14. 15. 16. 17. Councillor Cameron. Um, I've just got a note here. Capital expenditure 17. I'm just going to... Uh, I'm not sure what that applies to. Um, yeah, I read that. It might be on the next page then. I think it was about the arts or the museum. Well, have we not come up to that then? I've just got page 17 written down. Yeah, it could be there. Not making much sense to me. No, okay. I'll come back to it. I'll, I'll just find I'll out what I've written. 18. <coughs> Councillor Rawlinson. On page 19, under the loan repayments for cemeteries, at a thousand and fourteen percent, is that a typo or is that what is that? Um, through the chair, you'll actually notice that there is quite a lot of loan repayments a lot across the board here. That is because we have replaced a lot of our internal debt with external. So it shows there's both a loan repayment and then an extra loan being taken out because of the way these reports are put together. So they net off. Thank you. I, I, just, I had read that, but I thought it seemed such an extreme figure it might not fit into that. Thanks. It's 20. <coughs> Twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, the balance sheet. Councillor Cameron. Uh, just a, a back to the um, borrowing by activity. Arts and culture 2.36 external borrowing. Is that where we've moved it again from internal to external? Or is that, um, what's that? Can you remind me, Rachel, what that specifically what page is that again, Carol? Page 27. We start off with community facilities and support. And that's down there. Under what heading? Borrowing by activity. Yep, and the number you're looking at? Uh, arts and Culture, 2.36. Right, 2.36. Yep. That'll so, be an internal loan also. Uh, yeah, so through the chair there, it has okay. been a lot of Thank internal you. loans converted to external. Yep. <clears throat> Just a uh, question, page 26, on the, um, the funding from local government, and you've got the... Um, Dates of maturity. Is that date when it's due to be repaid, or is, is it fixed until that date? Is the loan fixed until that date? Through the chair, that's when we are due to repay those loans. How many of these loans are fixed or have swaps in place? Oh, I would have to go back and check. I believe we have four swaps in place, and they will be over the older loans. Um, most 
of the ones that we have taken recently have been floating, but I would need to go back and confirm exactly which ones are fixed and which ones are floating. Yeah. Does our policy say how much we will fix? Uh, there is percentage bans, and um, our advisors at Bancorp Treasury advise us what type of loan to take out when we um, we ask them every time we need to take a loan, and they'll advise us whether that needs to be fixed or floating to meet our Treasury management policies. Yeah, with interest rates being so low and only likely now to go one way, which is not down, <coughs> would it be prudent to start fixing them in for longer terms, 10 to 15, 20 years out, if possible? Through the Chair, there is a requirement under the Treasury management policy that only a portion is fixed. I can't remember what that percentage is off the top of my head, but it, under the policy we do require a certain amount of floating as well. Um, yep. But the, yeah, the, the team at Bancorp Treasury make sure that we're always within our policies with those. They will make sure you're within the policy, but do we need to review the policy with it? Because when the policy was set up, the interest rates were probably a lot different than what they are today. Different environment. Yeah. So, Paul. Uh, through Mr Mayor, the Treasury policy is actually being reviewed or out at the moment. Um, it's either gone out or it's going out very shortly uh, for consultation, so it has been amended. The quarterly Bancorp report shows the breakdown of what you're actually asking. Um, and I think from memory there are four swaps, but two of them are, only, are current and two of them coming in the future. So that's how you can actually lock the rates in by there's a couple of swaps that are, have yet to kick in but are in place ready to go. Um, and we can look at, tr at um, extending out the term. But the Treasury policy is currently being amended. Internal document at the stage or then coming to ours? It'll be coming to um, Council. Thanks. Page 20. Oh, John. Oh, thank you. Page 25. Um, receivables. $1.45 million in credit. Normally, receivables would be a debit because that's an amount owing to us. Have we got a mistake or what's going on? Please. Um, so through the chair, we did have a quick look at this, so um, I'm not 100, but it looks like what's happened is we had a receivable from a property sale, and we've received the settlement, but the offset just hasn't been applied yet. So this is the cash sitting in the receivables account, which has put it into a negative. Uh, I now can I found what I wrote down. Uh, page 17, uh, it is indeed the commercial property, and we look at the... Ex explanation as to why it's um, down and it's because there's some delay in settling at the business estate of 1.35 million and the 2.25 million hasn't been accred accredited yet to that account but it still leaves a variance of about one and a half million Paul are you aware of of that one from Colin Page, a top of page. I, I might have done my math wrong, but I think 1.35 and 2.25 is 3 point something, and we're 4 point something out. Perhaps you could have a look at um, it. So just just to point out the, through the chair as well that these variances are year to date. Um, yeah. So it's possible that at the end of the year, the variances that Colin has pointed out are what he expects to be the, at the end of the year. Because you won't, you wouldn't comment on anything. That's not going to be a permanent variance. So that may be the difference. In yes, there, he's got things. it's a permanent variance. He does remark on yeah. that, um, but, but not all of it might be. A no, no, I, I accept that probably three and a half million isn't. So there's one and a half million possibly a permanent variance, and I just wondered why that was. There must be another property sale or something else going on that we haven't we, discussed. We can have a look, but it would appear to be the sales are less than he forecast. Well, presumably. Yeah. yeah, but it's just not highlighted in the in the comment in the commentary underneath. That was all. Yep, page twenty-seven. It's twenty-eight. It's <coughs> twenty-nine. Takes us to the end of the variance report. So I'd like to move that we receive the variance report. Councillor Cameron, Councillor Rawlinson. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Councillor Carried.
Thank you, Rachel. Item number 15, standing item for council agenda. And Hamish, any questions or add to? Oh, I think it's first. Oh, no, no, he might answer okay. it. Hamish? <laughs> I will if you ask it. Um, uh, but uh, this was the response to uh, the um, discussion, I think, at the last council meeting where we were looking for a vehicle to enable councillors to uh, report back on matters that they had attended on council's behalf um, and uh, or if they had matters that might arise that they wished to uh, raise and therefore uh, have discussed by full council. The adjunct to this, which uh, didn't fit naturally with this uh, report, was the other piece around um, items at the activity briefing uh, flowing through to council. But the way in which we would see those uh, going is that, the, is that they then become a matter for a councillor to submit uh, following that discussion. So it still fits uh, broadly within this um, policy, as opposed to seeking a report at the activity briefing. So we felt that this um, hopefully covered uh, both met as well, not specifically referring to the activity briefings. Thanks. Uh, just out of interest, if I may ask, what is deadline, a report deadline schedule in Appendix 1? So, so that's the date that um, reports have to be to Philippa and her team in order to make an agenda. So you can't um, submit reports um, you know, at the very last minute and expect them to make the agenda. So that, so we will make sure you have knowledge of the deadline um, schedule appear, uh, ahead of any particular meeting. And if the report comes in um, on, on time, it goes on the agenda. If it misses that, it'll be in the, um, the council agenda in two weeks, two weeks' time. Thank you. How do we know what the deadline is and what the schedule is for deadline? We, we will send it to you. <clears throat> Did you want to say that? That's the, answer, the short answer is it's not in Appendix 1. Uh, Phil, oh, is that not attached? No, it's not. Philip might say where it will be. Um, we can certainly share that with you. It was it was originally attached. It's fallen out, I'm sorry. We'll put it on Stella and we can um, we'll no, try and anticipate no. when um, you're attending meetings and we'll give you an email reminder as well. So. Um, so uh, really the onus I think is on councillors who we can um, be aware of most of the meetings you attend but if you're attending something that we may not be aware of if you can just give us a quick an e email or heads up that, that you're attending and you're likely to have a report we can set up a timeline that works for you and gets it into a council agenda. Are you thinking email is better than Stella, Angus? For the agenda deadline? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Emails better than Stella for that um, deadline. Uh, Stuart. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. If a councillor sends in a request or something about some sort of item and the manager in that department knows the answer <coughs> straight off, will they re come when we come to the council meeting? Will they be able to say right on the spot that's what the answer is to your inquiry? Well, that, we don't need a report, we just orally say it. here's hey. the answer. Yes, I think the, the, the intent is that the matter of concern to the councillor will suddenly be on the agenda and it'll be able to be discussed. Now, if there's a ready answer that doesn't then require further work, then that'll be the end of the matter. If um, the answer isn't available in that time frame or the, it's a wide-ranging report or the councillor's not satisfied with the answer, uh, then they'll still be able to uh, move a motion to, um, to write a report. The intention of the motion... Um, uh, is that we understand then that it's the will of council that the report be written. Because one of the things that we, we face as um, staff uh, are individual conversations where a councillor might want to report on something, but they might be the only councillor that does. And it's very hard for us to respond to each and every uh, informal conversation around the need for something. Um, this is to try and ensure that the will of council uh, is that that report or that next um, action uh, be taken. But if we can answer it on the spot, then that'll be hopefully the end of it. Angus? Oh, sorry, Liz. Thanks. Um, I gave this a bit of a go and did a councillor report. I think it's right at the end of the agenda. Um, but just thinking, like, when two or more councillors attend a meeting, I mean, like, for example, um, Councillor Wilson and I went up to Double Hill Road the other day 
to meet with the roading team and, and some of the um, people up there. We're not both going to need to do a report on that meeting, I think. We can sort of delegate and figure that one out. You don't obviously need a lot of information on a small meeting like that. No, brief is better. And the intention is it's entirely up to the councillors. Yeah. So this was this was to be your vehicle to get matters on the agenda. So if, if you agree a report's not required from a ratepayer meeting, then don't submit it and it, it won't go in. If you do, then it will. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry to bother you, Mr Mayor. Um, yeah. I asked the question because when the Regional Water Management Strategy Committee meeting was meeting on, on a Tuesday, I was able to get the report to Philippa on Thursday and it was okay. Um, so leading on from that, if we are having council meetings every two weeks, why will there be a non-following schedule? For example, um, I thought if a council meeting was being held every two weeks, if you had your report in a week before, you might be all right. It's, it's the assumption of the week before that is the, 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 where the deadline hits. No, no, we're going to send that to you the week when the deadline is. And, there's, and, and, and we know there is always a day when there's a, there's a cut-off just missed that requires something to go to a meeting a bit further out. There's always, there's always got to be a time when we say that the agenda is now compiled uh, and no, nothing else can go in, and that that's the that's the day you, and that you need to know. Um, still submit your report. It's just that that would flow through to a subsequent meeting rather than the very next one that you might expect. There has to be a deadline. We we can't leave the agenda open for everyone's whim. Yeah, yeah. This is one meeting. I'll catch the next. Um, I think this is an ex excellent initiative and I think we all have things that we'd like to bring back to council and we have no route in which to do so. So I congratulate. Um, the team on um, progressing this, and I'd, if no one else has got any questions, I'd like to move the recommendation that we and a second, Councillor Mellon. Open for debate. This this will go through to PE as well because you don't want some topics on here. Public excluded is subject to the Local Official Information and Meetings Act. It can only be public excluded if it meets the criteria under the Act. It can't just be that a councillor doesn't want it to be discussed in public. It's exactly the same way as officers writing a report can't just um, put it in PE on a whim. It has to be for a, a reason that's in the, in the Act. So if we receive your report and it doesn't, in our view, meet the criteria under the Act, it will be in public meeting if it's clearly... Um, and there's three main ones, commercially sensitive, uh, the, protect the, net, uh, the privacy of natural individuals uh, uh, or subject to legal action. But sensitive, private um, sort of comment is, is no reason to be in public excluded automatically. Okay, I'll put the motion on my favour. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Over the page 16, uh, Mayor's report. <coughs> And we have a recommendation here at the bottom of page 120 that the Mayor be authorised to have Council's proxy vote at the Local Government New Zealand AGM 2021 and the Deputy Mayor be the alternate proxy. Lane, moved. Seconded. Stuart. Any discussion? If not, I'll put the motion. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Carried. And... We're still looking for a couple of people who would like to go to the AGM, which is in Blenheim this year, 15th to 17th of July. Is that a hand up? Was it Blaine? I've worked it for a couple of minutes. We can get it. We do need a, a time because we've got a uh, book in. So uh, there's been a couple of emails been out. Um, Councillor McMillan's going, myself. Uh, Hamish is attending. So if we went uh, up for another two people if they would like to go. Car Carolyn? Carolyn and someone else to think about quite it. Happy. Quite happy? Yeah. Well, Lane. Sure. Carolyn and Lane. Got that? Cool. That's good. Over the page 122, the Mayor's report and just make comment on the Audit New Zealand, the um, workshop that myself, Councillor Brahma Wilson, 
went to. It was very good. I was on fraud and ethics and integrity. It was good, good workshop run by the auditor, Audit New Zealand, which was good. One thing that struck me is um, is reporting that councillors get, and uh, one thing that sticks in my mind was we receive regular reporting and from management, and um, it's, don't tell me, show me. Was what the auditor was saying. So that's um, yeah, probably do both, but show me the evidence of what you're telling me. It's uh, it's a good. I thought it was a good line that they came up with. Um, Meryl Callender, just one deletion there. Kai for kids, that didn't happen. But everything else did. Another busy two weeks. That's my guy. Um, <coughs> April the sixth, the community LTP webinar. I'm asking the question because the last correspondence I had with council was to be advised. How did that go? Were there many on it and how did one get on it? Uh, it was on Facebook, YouTube, uh, 28 to 30 people were on it. Um, yeah, I, th I think it went well. I haven't, haven't looked at the Facebook comments or anything, but uh, all people could feed in through their comments, their questions. I think it was a new method that seemed to work work okay. Yeah. Thank oh, I guess. Supplementary. Um, the last feedback I had from council via email was, we'll be advised how to get on. So how did one get on? Did you read your email? Yep, that's why I'm quoting you. Uh, and sure, I was here when it was happening, so... Right. No, I'm, I'm saying the last um, correspondence I was yep. given by Council was, it will be a, you will be advised. I think Council, Councillor Cameron may be agreeing with me. Thank you. So you're suggesting that uh, we forgot to advise on how... Uh, never to, advised. Right, OK. We'll sharpen up there then, that department. Oh, I, I just wondered, because, um, you know, we have to bring everything to Council now, so it's good. Good, Liz. Um, you, uh, I watched it um, last night, and well, I looked at it while I was at another meeting, and then watched it um, later on. So you can go onto the council Facebook page, and the whole presentation is up on on Facebook. Um, but I probably knew about it because I got a notification from Facebook, but I don't remember getting an email. Councillor Rawlinson. I was the same. I had a notification, so I, w I watched it on Facebook from the beginning, and it w came across really well. And I was going to congratulate Tony because I thought she seemed to be the facilitator, and I thought she did an excellent job. That's good. Well done. Yep. But I think you're right, Angus. There was a wee gap there. So uh, future, we will look at um, filling that. Anything further on the mayor's report? Move it. I'll move. Seconded. Councillor Cameron. All in favour, please. Aye. Aye. Carried. Good. Councillor's reports. Oh. Mm -hmm. Page 129. What's that one then? 129. It's one, two, three. It's the copy of the Oh, yeah. <clears throat> there. Item number 17, and the report there from Deputy Mayor Liz McMillan. Any questions? Been busy as well, Liz. And over the page, Councillor Wilson on the Zone 5 and 6 metre Wanaka. Councillor Rawlinson. Thank you. Just a question around that. I mean, we could all write a report on all the things we've been to, but you don't want us to just put in a list of everything we've been to in the last two weeks or months, do you? I took it as not that. It's not a list of everything we've done. It's if we've done something special or a conference or something specific. Is that correct? Yeah, that was that previous report that we just did mm. was along that. As yeah. much or as little as you wish, or mm. well, not too much. So. Thanks or items that need to be addressed at, at council. Yeah. 
um, yeah, to inform the ones that are here who weren't there as what was um, going on. Councillor McKay. Mr Mayor, because I think that this is a brilliant concept and the reports are very well written, I move that they be received formally. Seconder for that. Uh, Lynette. Yeah, I'll, I'll second it. And you've got a question? I've just had a question. You don't have a question, Angus? Or you're turned oh, off then. Right, sorry. Lynette. Um, I'll second it, but I've just got a question about the um, vehicle trust, just um, numbers and how it was go is going, because it's kind of the only vehicle we kind of know how to get information now from you. Yeah, uh, Caroline, if you go off, those will come on. Thank you. Thank you. So we had a, um, a meeting this morning um, and numbers are low. They're not um, great. And um, so we sort of came up with quite a few ideas of how we could get the information out there. Um, at the moment, the service is on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. And we're so we're just sort of wondering how... Um, if that's going to work in the future, we're still on our um, six months trial and, and we're about three months in, so um, we're just waiting to see. We um, did have um, an idea today that we would um, work in with Wheels Week and maybe do um, sort of a, a service which was either free or a gold coin donation during that week and do a bit of promotion during the school holidays. So. Yeah, there's, there's still a bit of work to do and we're still in the middle of that trial um, and we were very pleased to see the council um, support um, the um, LTP ECAN um, of $5,000, which, which is basically, I think it's 85 cents per rate payer per annum who don't live in Ashburton um, Township. Yep, great. Uh, Carol. Hi, um, this is going back to the last discussion really for you, Paul, if I may, through you, Mr Chair, is the Bancorp report. Last time we got the Bancorp report, it said that interest rates were going to be oh, zero, possibly very low. Just, uh, Carolyn, just talk into the mic. Very, very low, if not zero percent. And then you alluded today, and I meant to bring it up, but I had to find my point on page 17. You alluded today about let's fix them because the interest rates are going up. Has there been another report in the interim that's changed the forecast? I don't know, but one of us will be correct. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd missed something, but I haven't yeah. seen an additional report. Has anybody else seen an additional report? No. No. Must be due as a report, a bank um, report, report. True, Mr Mayor, it comes out quarterly, yeah. so there'll be one at the end of, yeah, it'll be very shortly actually coming out. Um, the reality is that, in my view, interest rates can't move down much lower because you're actually paying for the margin now from the lender rather than the interest rate costs. You're just paying the margin, so there's a limit to how much they can come down. Whether they'll go up, if you read, there's different views on whether they're going yeah, to go up or not. Because they did imply they were going to come down most 100% guarantee at 0% by September, October. Or yeah, you'll, you won't be able to borrow at 0% no, because no. the lender will want a margin. Oh, I and so, yeah. That. yeah. Sure. Thanks, Mr Chairman. In the middle of my report, it says that Monday evening we had a session. It was quite hard-hitting for somebody that um, comes out of prison, his family's abandoned him, he's given $50, nobody wants to employ him because he's got a record, he can't get accommodation, and you wonder why people slide back into crime. It was quite illuminating. You think when people have been to prison, they could get straight when they get out, but especially if their families abandon them, they're alone in the world, and unless the probation officer helps them, it's, life can be really difficult. I thought it was quite a, a session for people like us, sort of middle class. We don't think about those sort of things. And yeah, not only him, it can be a her too. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, but you're right, it, was, um, it highlighted a, an issue that um, happens out there. D don't? And when I read that, it took me back to at one of the... Um, it's not safe for communities, it's the community house every second month has a, a meeting that anyone can go to. And we had a speaker there, and I don't know whether you were there, Liz, and it was a lady up from Rolleston 
who is part of a wider support group, and there is support for those people because they are a support group that they don't sit inside from the prison or anywhere that do nurture those, exactly those people. So there is support there. It's a matter of knowing where to get it. Yeah, knowing where to get it, I think, is probably the key. And that's probably the key, but from Community yeah. House, Maxine Hooper would know. Yep. Yeah. That's good. Nothing further. It's, we'll move into committee. I'll move. Seconded. Councillor Brown. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Good. Wait for...